Welcome to Now You See TV. I'm your host, Jake Grant, and tonight we are going to be joined by Ali Sadatin, who has been on the show uh, multiple times before, but it's always a pleasure. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge. And tonight we're going to be talking about the Council of Elohim and um, the fallen angels of the antediluvian age and, and get into all of the history behind uh, these figures and really the concept of them passing down knowledge to uh, Adam and to his offspring. And so, Ali, welcome to Now You See TV. Thank you, Jake, for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here and share with you guys. I really enjoy it. Yeah, it's um, it's a really interesting topic to me because we see throughout um, ancient mythology, you have the Greek mythos and the Syrian pantheons, um, and they all talk about these figures that come down, these gods, little g, that came down and interacted with humans and seemed to pass off their knowledge and and uh, and really they weren't very savory characters. Um, and so it's important for us to dive into a biblical perspective of these ancient mythos. Um, and uh, and I, I'm really excited to get into this with you, Ali. Uh, so first, I would like to ask you, what brought you into studying into this particular topic? Well, um, it was an interesting uh, series of events that with hindsight, I clearly see it was orchestrated by God that there was a great uh, time of unveiling uh, coming over the people of God where all kinds of hidden parts of scripture, and I say hidden in plain sight because there's over a thousand verses that talk about this. It's not like something, you know, lost somewhere behind the couch, but things that were always here that were hidden from us were about to be unveiled by God for this generation. And um, it was part of my path and my blessing uh, that, that, the, that the Lord began to explain these things to us in the mid-1990s when um, it was really 1996 that we were discovering the, the idea that the sons of God and the daughters of men in the book of Genesis um, had procreated and these were real beings and you know, that started to take us down the road of paying more attention to passages that talked about this like for instance in the book of Job in the, uh, chapter 37, where it says, when God made the earth, he tells Job, were you here when the sons of God cried out for joy, placing these beings well before the creation of Adam himself, uh, being with God? Uh, and it was like, okay, this is interesting. So these guys are real, you know, they're, they're, they're interacting. When you think of angels, you have an idea in your mind that is handed down through Christian culture and sometimes these ideas are so deeply ingrained that we don't even we quite realize that we have an idea we're functioning through. It just seems like, well, we, this is the truth. We all know it's true. We all know this is how it works. A preacher says it this way. The seminary graduate repeats it. We all are on the same page. And suddenly, you know, God was about to interrupt this. For us, again, um, it was really the passage about the throne of Satan being in Zeus. That was instrumental in God using that as a wedge. Uh, asking ourselves, well, who who was, what was in the city of Pergamum, and that was a throne, uh, that was the altar to Zeus, okay, so if the altar of Zeus and the throne of Satan are the same, then who was Zeus, we thought, well, he was one of the heads, uh, he was the leader of the Greek pantheon of gods, and the question then suddenly came up, well, could it be that there's a connection between him, or uh, between Satan and Zeus, and if so, uh, is there a connection between the gods and the fallen angels? I mean, is that what we're trying, what we should understand? And so I went and uh, had a program called eSword, and it allowed me to isolate any word I wanted throughout the Bible and ask it to spit out every single passage in the Old and New Testament that uh, had that word in it. And so that's what I did. I, I went and, you know, isolated the word gods, um, and I had, you know, uh, I have some of my photocopies here. These, these are all the passages. These, these are just scriptural passages, one after the other. And this was from the mid-1990s. Um, I, I had all these passages come out uh, that had to, the word gods in it. And I was very surprised because uh, the term for it was Elohim, which was a term that was used for God himself. Uh, yet, there are many, many passages that talked about the gods of the nations using the same word, the Elohim of the Goim, the gods of the nations, as you were saying, in Assyria and Greece and all these places. It's like, well, who were these guys? 
Um, I was aware of the writings of ancient astronauts, and even though I didn't adhere to the theories of Zachary Sitchin or Eric von Donneken, uh, but I did appreciate some of the facts that they were pulling out that was not always present in regular archaeological books about the incredible knowledge that existed at the foundation of civilization when it came to architecture. Um, and you look at something like the ziggurat and you think, well, this is easy to build. Or you look at a pyramid and you think, well, it's easy to build. Well, once you educate yourself about architecture, you realize how complex these structures are mathematically. And uh, you look at, for instance, the, the uh, handing down of laws um, that were the foundation of civilization, including you know, divine law, um, astronomy, um, medicine. And, and so all of these writings that existed, like in the library of Ashurbanipal, who was the last great king of the Assyrian civilization, he uh, was the dethroned or deposed in 612 BC as the Babylonians rose, well, he had a library. He was the king, but as the king, he was also the priest. As the priest, he was also the holder of knowledge. And it was required from childhood that he study, you know, all of these tablets that existed in the library of Nineveh. And when uh, English archaeologist, um, I believe it was uh, Henry Laird, who discovered the library of Nineveh, with 25,000 tablets, these tablets were, you know, classified in, in, in categories of knowledge like medicine, architecture, mathematics, and in tablet number 23, uh, Ashurbanipal himself, the king, wrote that he was thankful that the god of the scribes, the god of the scribes, had taught him how to read the writings from before the flood. It was like, wow, there's even writings from before the flood that this guy has. And he had prepared these dictionaries for himself that translated his language, Akkadian, to the ancient Sumerian language of the oldest tablets. And using his lexicons, we were able to read those most ancient tablets. So it was interesting to note that in this library, the majority of the tablets were actually about the gods, their deeds, their epitaphs, um, uh, you know, their, the, who, their names, their purposes. And it's like, okay, if these guys in the ancient world were so wise, um, did they collectively believe in this mythological figures? I mean, they were deluded to that point. How is that possible that our ancestors were, you know, so, so spiritually far off and so the idea started to kind of come into the consciousness that, wait a second, these guys, this is, there's reality here. So then when I uh, delved into the uh, scripture passages that I dug up, the surprise even increased even there even more. Um, for instance, for me, one of the key passages is Deuteronomy 10.17, Debarim 10.17 from the Torah. It says that God, Yahweh, is the God of gods the El of the Elohim, and the Lord of Lords, the Adon of the Adonim. And now the question was, wait a second, how could he be the leader, the mighty one, that's what El means, the mighty one, of the these mythological beings? How could God be associated with these mythological beings? Um, for instance, Joshua 22, 22 says, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows and Israel he shall know, and it goes on. But it's interesting, I thought, what? Joshua calls God the God of gods? How could that be? And so the, 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 it became clear that uh, these passages uh, that talked about these other gods, they, they admonished them, like they judged them, like in Exodus 12, 12, where it says in the Passover passage, which is studied every year uh, during the recitation of the Seder story, of the Passover story, the Haggadah, where it says uh, that God is himself will come and he will judge the gods of Egypt, the Elohim of Mizraim, he will judge. It says that in Exodus 12, 12. I was like, wait a second, God's not going to judge mythological beings. Um, he, these gods, like in Psalm 97, 7, they are admonished and told to worship God. They are told to worship God. So suddenly it's like, wow, the gods of the ancient world were real beings, and there was hundreds of passages that I was now finding that talked about 
the reality of them, like for instance, in in uh, the letter to the Corinthian church, uh, Rav Shaul, uh, Paul, quotes the book of Deuteronomy to them, where he says, they sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not. So this idea that they sacrificed the devils, the pagans, the, sac the, the nation sacrificed to the devils, the book of Deuteronomy is talking about Egypt, but Paul actually says the Greeks. So he continues to, to build this link that even in my time, this is continuing, this sacrifice, which is not to gods, but to devils. Um, even before the flood, you know, we are told, uh, let's say in Joshua 24, and Joshua said unto all the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Uh, again, jo uh, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. I mean, that's the first of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That is actually what causes the first exile, according to the prophet Jeremiah, is the worship of these other guys. Suddenly it was, okay, these guys are real. What can we now know about them? And there are many, many other pastors that I could reference. But just to, to kind of continue the story, um, I'm going to be releasing a PDF file of all of these pastors. If people sign up for the newsletter on my website or the YouTube channel, they'll be able to download it and see it for themselves. So who are these guys? Now we start to dig deeper into their identity. And... You know, Psalm 82, 6 says, I have said, ye gods, ye are gods, meaning that people, you are Elohim, and all of you children of the Most High, yes. But in Psalm 82, 1, a few verses higher, it says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. So God, again, is inside of his congregation, judging among the gods. Uh, so the, there is this heavenly host that is referenced to these heavenly beings. God is among them. Now, the book of Revelation teaches us that one third have rebelled and have gone with the Nachash, the shining one, the serpent. And, and now the story was kind of taking shape. So it looks like these guys had come to the earth and has posed as objects of worship to all of these nations. And when the conversation between Satan and the Lord now became more clear when he said that all of the kingdoms of the earth have been given to my dominion and I'll give them to you. It's like, oh, wow. So it wasn't just like some, you know, spiritual entities in other dimensions. These were like real guys with temples. They were being worshipped. Their sacrifices were being offered to them. They were providing all kinds of knowledge, which I'm going to get into in a moment. But I just want to kind of establish the bird's eye view of the landscape before we start breaking down the details of the transmission of knowledge that has formed history and civilization itself and um, uh, where it's all going prophetically, which is very, very important to understand. This is a great unveiling, looking behind the scenes. Um, so, so these guys existed uh, b at the beginning with God because they were there in the book of Job when the earth was created and the sons of God cried out for joy. Um, and they were seem to exist behind the nations and it was like well how did they get to become lord over these nations um well deuteronomy 32 uh verse 8 and 9 was was profound it explained that when god divided the nations and uh gave them their boundaries which goes back to the tower of babel that's when it occurred because at the tower of babel there's only one nation and they all have the same language. And by the way, they were united behind a body of knowledge that they felt empowered them to, you know, reach all the way into heaven. It wasn't, it wasn't just their will. It, they had something going for them that they felt, you know, you know, gave them that ability. So when God divided the nations at the Tower of Babel, he then created boundaries for them. And um he divided them according to the number of the sons of God. I was like, wow, this is so interesting. Um, in most of the Bibles I had, it said according to the number of the sons of Israel. But I came across the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Torah, uh, of, of, of the uh, uh, Old Testament, into um, Greek, uh, you know, some 300 years before the time of Christ, uh, of Yeshua. And so it was like, okay, this is interesting. It says sons of God in that book, which was very authoritative. And Paul quoted it. The Lord quoted it. So this was an authoritative translation. Then 
the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they were discovered in the Qumran caves, there was actually a piece of that passage in Hebrew discovered, which became the oldest Hebrew uh, written document of the book of Deuteronomy. And in there as well, it said that the, when God divided the nations, he did so according to the number of the sons of God. So we're like, wait a second, the sons of God, they weren't just, you know, seeding the earth with their own uh, seed in order to create hybrids, which is a tale perhaps for another day as to how all this comes together. They were actually the sovereign over these nations. And it was like, wow, that's so interesting. So this is very important. Uh, this has been hidden, but it's right there in Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9. And then when you continue the story, you get to Daniel number uh, chapter 10, what you have is these uh, this angel is coming to give information of scriptural importance to the prophet Daniel. But it says that the prince of Persia withstood me. He says, you know, 21 days ago when you began to fast from wine and sugar and pray, I came. The prince of Persia withstood me for 21 days to the point where I had to call for up for backup for Michael, your prince, which we believe is a mighty, mighty warrior, a general of God's armies, the one who at the end of the age, you know, arrests Satan. So this guy is very powerful. He had to come to hold back the prince of Persia for this angel to continue and give this message of scriptural importance to Gabriel I mean, to uh, to Daniel. Now it was clear oh, wow, what that passage meant, you know, that passage um, um, made sense now because these sons of God were behind the nations, like all of these hundreds of passages are explaining, and uh, like Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 was explaining, and then going forward into the New Testament when Satan says, "I all the, the uh, kingdoms of the earth have, have been given to in my dominion, now that made sense, again, based on Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 and 9, and all of these hundreds of pastors that are discovered. So it was clear that the nations of the earth um, were not judged by mythological beings. They were actually judged by beings that in Christian tradition, we have come to call the fallen angels, even though the term fallen angels does not exist anywhere in the whole Bible. It's a term of Christian culture. In the Bible, they are called the Elohim, the gods, that's the translation in our Bibles. And it was like, wow, this is so interesting. Um, uh, so now we understood that, you know, there was, there was this foundation to the UFO presence that went all the way back to the beginning of the creation of Adam. They have been with us all this time. And we were judged for dead and left for dead. I mean, not left for dead, obviously, God has always had a relationship with us, but we were judged and condemned to death at the garden in the Garden of Eden. And these guys who were also cast out because of their rebellion, we and them kind of became part of the same realm, the realm that God must come now and pull us out. But this is only the beginning of the tale. So, so these beings exist. Um, for instance, look at, let's say, 1 Kings 22, verse 19. Um, it says, um, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitude of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth, Gilead, and going to his death there? One suggested this and another that. Like This was a conversation between God and his heavenly council. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. But by what means, the Lord asked, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of his prophets. He said, you will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So we hear this conversation between God and his counsel. And, and I believe that a part of his counsel is physical beings. Now they may be made out of light. Like, you know, but they still have a body, like they're clothed with light, but they still, you know, are actually, you know, physical in that sense. And then there are those who may be purely spirit, like the one that we see in this passage. But I think that that his counsel is made of, of, of both. Um, so there was like, wow, God is having a conversation with these guys. And and as you follow this, this counsel, you see, wow, they're present in the creation of the earth. They're present in the Garden of Eden, because you look at the story 
of the of Genesis, and it's plural. It says, "Let us make man in our image." It's like, wow, where is the plural coming from? Traditionally, the church has thought that it's the Trinity, but because of this insight into what Elohim, I mean, you know, in, in, in the late nineties, when I would say to 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 someone of, in the leadership rank in in, in the body of the Messiah. Hey, I think that I have a new perspective on what the book of Genesis might be talking about. Basically, I could one the second I would say I don't think it's the Trinity alone that is being referenced in the plurality, basically the conversation would stop right there and then. But now I see that other very prominent Christians, such as you know, uh, Dr. Michael Heiser or Derek Gilbert, who've come up with books that are saying the same things. It, it it comforts me to know, okay, this really was part of the unveiling that came from God. So the book of Genesis says that, that there was this, uh, let us make man in our image. And then when man sins, God says, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Uh, you know, we're going to bar him now from being eternal in this state, right? He can't eat from the tree of life. So there again, there's a plurality. Yes, in ancient Semitic languages, it was customary to use the plural to talk about the deity. It was like the, like the royal we, you know, it was, it was, it was polite. Um, so that's true. Um, however, you have to put these things into the whole council of scripture, put it into context with all these other hundreds of passages. Then you understand, okay, there was a multitude. And even at Sinai, we are told when the law was given through angels that God's council was present, so there's, they were present uh, in heaven. They are present in key moments on the earth. And then there is this group that has rebelled under uh, the accuser, the adversary, uh, Satan. And, and we are told in the book of Revelation as one-third. And they have been given dominion over the nations, according to Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. And verse 9 says, but God chose Jacob for himself. And so now it became clear uh, so much of, of the history of Israel suddenly came to light that in the ancient world, God was going to shine his light out of the temple of Jerusalem where he would put his menorah, and the nations would have these spiritual forces behind them that were against this light, against this temple, against the plans, against the throne of David. And that's why there was this constant battle between the gods of, uh, of, of the nations and the God of Israel. Ali. Now... Um, if I could, I mean, people really do have an aversion to that term uh, gods um, uh, because, you know, the, the Bible is in many ways a monotheistic book. And, and so whenever people kind of use the term gods uh, or the Elohim, I can understand why they kind of have an aversion to that because uh, they probably think that you're putting these gods, little g, on the same level of, of uh, Yahuwah, you know, on the same level of the yeah. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the creator. And so um, whenever you are approached kind of with that, you know, how do you respond? I mean, were these... Um, created beings from the creator and you know they weren't just you know beings that are on his level yeah that's an excellent question um the bible is very clear that there's no one like god who is unto god among the gods you know it's a song no one is like god he is unique and that's what monotheism is it, he has no like he's the creator of time and space and the host of the heavens so all of these guys were created by him and they have a story, they have free will like we do, and they have commandments and laws, and God's will is known to them. And they are living out a story inside of the creation like we are, because remember, we are the children of the Elohim. Like it says in Psalm 82, 6, I have said, ye are Elohim, ye are gods. I mean, the, the Lord Yeshua quoted that. He said, doesn't it say in your own scriptures, ye are Elohim and the sons of El Elyon and the sons of the Most High? referencing Adam because Adam was the son of Elohim. He was made in the image of Elohim. So we are of the world, of God and angels. We, the Adamic race, is of the world, of God and the angels. And that's why we are in this crazy story, in this crazy cosmic tale with them. However, these beings like us are well below God. They're God's creation. The enemy, Satan, is our enemy. Yes, he's against God's will, but he's not God's enemy in that sense. It's not like God against Satan. Satan is, uh, has his powers under the control of God. We see in the book of Job, God says to Satan, yes, you can do this to Job, but you can't do this to Job. You can do this to Job, but you can't do this to Job. 
So it's clear that, that evil is contained by the will of God, that God is sovereign over good and evil and over all of his creatures. Um, to your point, when we released our documentary, UFOs, Angels, and Gods, in 2006, I received a steady you know, uh, amount of criticism of people saying, why have I called these guys gods? And people sometimes would upload our documentary on YouTube and they would cross out the word gods and put fallen angels or demons. And I give my only answer to them as it is to you or to anybody who might say is, I am just repeating the words that are in the Bible, right? The scripture I had was using called them that. I was just correcting the name they were given by the Holy Spirit, the author of the Bible called them that and so i'm just repeating it i mean if they called the munchkins i'd be called i'd say you know you have those angels and munchkins but it does but it didn't say that um so yes it's it's interesting in our culture the way we see it however we see that after the holy spirit is is given to the world um there is a humbling of the rule of these beings they they we 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 change chapters in history we go from the age of polytheism which goes back to before the flood to suddenly within a few hundred years monotheism spreads all over the roman or roman greco-roman world which i believe is specifically the world the western world is where the throne of satan is and has always been so it's in the world you know when paul, the lord says to paul his cousin from the tribe of benjamin go i think it's in Acts 26 go uh, to the Roman world, to the Gentiles to whom I now sent you, and free them from the power of Satan and bring them into the light of God. He says that, free them from the power of Satan. So the, these these entities that Paul is now speaking against in, in his great speech in, in, the, in Ephesus, where he says, you know, we don't struggle with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers in high places. And when he, he, he points in, to the Corinthians that you, your countrymen, are sacrificing the devils, not the gods. Um, God has sent his emissaries into these places and they are eaten by wild lions and beaten up and crucified in Colosseums by the order of the gods. You know, you look at, for instance, the Diocletian who carried out the greatest Christian persecution. He first consulted Apollo, the sun god, uh, in Delphi and the answer came that the Christians are the enemies of the gods. And so he suspended their civil rights, um, then uh, burnt all the Bibles he could find, arrested them, and tortured them until they sacrificed to the gods who were the backbone of imperial power or died. And this may be in our future um, coming as well, that, that you know these forces continue to have dominion over the world, and we believe they're going to give their uh, authority to, to uh, the beast. Now... You have to understand it's very important to, to, to keep in mind that God and his heavenly council and his angels and his Holy Spirit and his presence are far greater than all of this that's plaguing us on the earth. We should take comfort and in knowing that and knowing that all this means is that scripture is correct and a great unveiling is happening. Because what Satan did is he took a piece of paper and he wrote myth on it. And he just put this piece of, he just put a drape on all of this huge amount of history that came from all the nations concerning these objects of worship. And he just put a white drape over on all of it. And he took a little piece of paper and he wrote the word myth on it and he stuck it. And when, in a moment when I kind of explain all the knowledge that's been handed down, I'll show how this is exactly what was carried out in the culture. I'll break it down so you can see the process. However, this was the big idea. And so we all fell asleep thinking, oh, there's the God of Israel. Well, yes, he's real. And then all of these guys were worshiping just like, you know, stuff like this, like, you know, oh, hello. And, and meanwhile, uh, Paul says that idol worship is the worship of the creation over the creator. Therefore, you know, angels can be uh, idols. It says, the, Paul says to, to the, in the letter to the Col uh, Colossians, he says, do not worship angels. He says that. It's like, oh, okay. To the Galatians, he says, if another one preaches a different gospel to you, even an angel from heaven, don't believe him. The one that, that, that other than the one we have preached to you. So he talks about this this connection, right? Um, so this is uh, this was interesting that Satan just blurred our thinking by saying, hey, it's all there's nothing to see here, folks. Meanwhile, he's like very active. 
And this idea of being worshipped as little G's, where does that come from? Where the Holy Spirit gives us a revelation in the heart of Satan in Isaiah chapter 14, it says that he wants to be like the Most High. It says that he wants to be above the stars of God, which is an idiom for these shining ones, these 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 you know creatures, which are that we call angels again. Um, he, this is his heart. He want they want to be worshipped, and that's why they posed as objects of worship. Uh, Michael Heiser makes a very interesting suggestion that I never thought about. He says that it was their duty to point the nations to worship the God of gods, but in return, they deflected that to themselves. And that's why they came under judgment, and that's why God is removing their seat of power and giving it to the sons and daughters of Adam in the Messiah, who are going to be the new lights. You know, like God says to Abraham, your, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars of heaven. Why the stars? Because these guys are luminaries, and we are going to be luminaries. And when the Lord stood on the mountain and was transfigured, it was the beginning. He was the son of David, and he was the first one to be one of these future shining bright stars. And so the, there, there may be a connection and a power exchange here. So kind of let's start now from the top. I mean, this is the bird's eye view. The bird's eye view is that God has never been alone. He's created these beings, he has a council, he, he talks to them, he commands them, they carry very important duties. Sometimes he sends a messenger to earth, and that's where we get the word angel from. It's a function that they carry out, but they're, that's not their whole function. And, and then there's these guys, the sons of God, especially, it seems to be what they're called. So the hierarchy is that on top, there is the God of gods, El of the Elohim. Then right below him, very close to him, is his council, the Elohim. The God, the, that's the term, the gods. It refers to him as the one God, but also to these beings he's created. It's even possible that, that there are these beings made in the image of many council members in the book of Genesis, and then Adam was made in the image of the God of gods. And again, that's, that's for another show, uh, kind of before the flood, the creation story. Um, and then underneath them, there's the sons of God, the Benai Ha Elohim. And we're really going to now focus on those guys, the Benai Ha Elohim, the sons of God. They're also called the Watchers in the book of Daniel and the book of Enoch. These guys, you know, are very important. And then there is the Shidim, which are the evil spirits. And so this is kind of, you know, the, the, the hierarchy. Now, sometimes there's these guys who walk over and bring a messenger in God. And in Hebrew, that's Malak. It literally, in the ancient uh, writing, in the ancient Hebrew writing, it has like the walking stick, like this guy's going to walk over and give you a message. And that's where the Greek word angelos comes from, which means messenger. But sometimes in the New Testament period, we tend to take all of this hierarchy and complexity and the relationship they had with the nations and all of that and compress it into a single term, angel, and then over the past 2,000 years, we've created lots of ideas about them through paintings and kind of posted notes and all kinds of ideas that are not biblical, but they have come to be nearly biblical for us to the point where all of this seems like, where is this coming from? Well, it's coming from inside of the Bible. Um, so now let's start from the beginning. Um, what happened? Well, it seems that the same way that the nations were given to the hand of the sons of God or the fallen angels, and Jacob was chosen uh, for by God, well, Jacob received information from God. He received knowledge, uh, laws, um, and that's how the society was born. Moses comes down from the mountain, and it's the beginning of the transmission of the instructions of God. Eventually, they, it seems that it's, it's possible uh, to divide it into 613 categories of law, um, there was knowledge about architecture. How do you build the Mishkan, the, the little tent of meeting? Then how do you build the Temple of Solomon? Okay, there's architectural blueprints and knowledge, knowledge about how to regulate every aspect of society. Then there's knowledge about kingship. Oh, there's going to be one of you who's going to be the king, you know, from the tribe of Judah. And eventually, of course, God himself will come to be that king. Um, so there's a scepter of rule. There's a body of knowledge regulating life and, and how would God, how holiness, godliness, and all that. Living with God and, and through God's ways, managing marriage, finances, uh, crimes, um, farming. I mean, every really aspect of life is under uh, God's teachings. And a nation is born with boundaries, right? And these are the boundaries, and then God is the one protecting it, and there's a covenant. Well, this is interesting. This transmission of knowledge that came to Jacob was not unique. 
The fallen angels imitating God because they're imitators, they have been, they were doing this in their own nations. And let me kind of build it from the beginning for you. Let's go to the Garden of Eden and I'll build it from there all the way to uh, the 21st century. So in and the Garden of Eden. Ali, yes? before we get into um, that, I just want to head off um, the whole Sethite theory that says that these angels or these beings would never interact with mankind. Um, and I, maybe, maybe you'll get to that um, in Genesis, Genesis 6, but I know there's people watching right now who, just like you said, have inherited a lot of their doctrines and, and opinions on Scripture through the seminary and the lens of uh, you know teachers from the past few hundred years who don't believe that angels would ever come down and interact with human mankind. And, uh, and, and I, I don't want to jump ahead of myself here, but um, I wanted to make sure you'd address that for those watching who who might have gone to seminary and who might have um, heard that, you know, angels can never come down and interact with mankind or um, anything like that. Are you, uh, well, what kind of traction are you talking about? Are you talking about like the angel who sat on the tombstone of the Lord when it says that he removed and he sat on it? It says that, so it was physical. Are you talking about the angels that had a meal with Abraham in the plains of Mamre? Uh, like there are so many passages of interaction as some have even entertained angels unawares. So we should be hospitable, we're told. Like where do these ideas come from that <clears throat> angels don't interact with humans? They're all over guess, the script. Yeah, the, f the kind of um, drawing from the mythos of the Greek culture and the Assyrian culture of how these gods, little g, would come down and they'd um, procreate with human women, for example. Um, that right. seems to be the biggest aversion in the modern seminary um, doctrine that's being pushed. And I think that's the main topic that people really get offended at. If you say, yeah, these angels, they, you know, these, these angels that were rebelling against God primarily, they're the ones that came down and, and, and did these things. So um, I think that's the one area where they don't believe angels can even do that. Um, yeah, and so I, I wanted saying, to ask you about the that. Lord, when the Lord was asked, you know, uh, um, by the Sadducees, you know, there's this whole question about if a man dies and he and he hasn't uh, uh, had any children, it's it's the uh, his brother has to marry the woman and, and try to continue the line of his own brother by giving her a child. And if he dies, another one. And so they tell a story to the Lord. There are seven brothers. They all married her, but none of them produced children. Then they died. Then they went to heaven. There was the last, you know, the, there was the judgment of the uh, the resurrection because Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So they're trying to use the laws of God to trick the Lord and say, look, the resurrection doesn't make sense um, if, if this law is truly from God. Because once they're resurrected, well, whose wife is she? And then the Lord said, well, the in the resurrection will be like the angels in heaven, neither uh, you know, marrying or giving into marriage. And so the people tend to use that passage uh, uh, since I've been involved in this from the mid 1990s, uh, from the beginning, you know, people use the same passage, that one passage and they go, you see, you see, there's no way that angels could procreate with humans. Well, first of all, th those are the angels in heaven. We're not talking about the angels in heaven. We're talking about the angels that have fallen from heaven and, um, and again, the Bible calls them the sons of God. And we see that Satan is amongst them in the book of Job, uh, in both uh, the, two, the first and second chapter, we're told that. And we see that the nations have been given to their dominion in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. And we see that the prince of Persia is one of them who's fighting an angel from heaven. So so these guys is the ones we're talking about, the sons of God. And, and they are doing something that is terribly wrong. Um, and and they're they're doing it because scripture says so, um, and and it has been understood that way uh, all the way till about the first century of even the Christian era. It was understood that way by Jewish sages. It was understood. I mean, the Talmud is a book of the commentary, and so there's you, know, you can always find a commentary that sees it in a different way. But um, I know for a fact that there were commentaries that understood it that way as well, um, and. Uh, but it became a, a source of embarrassment. It's really around the fifth century that the idea that these were not actually angels starts to really enter, um, you know, uh, uh, the imagination of people. However, um, the Bible is clear uh, in 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 every time the sons of God appear, they're here before the creation of Adam. 
they're here when Satan appears to in the court of God in heaven with uh, in the story of Job. Uh, they they are here when the nations are divided. Uh, therefore, in the book of Genesis, the passage is also talking about these these guys, uh, and it's not talking about some you know line of humans. And yes, they are procreating. Now, the the the, the book of Job, uh, Enoch talks about this as well, which was a book that. Jude, the brother of the Lord, you know, the Jude, there are two brothers, you know, Jesus had two brothers that wrote letters in the New Testament. One is uh, Jacob, whom we know as James, and you know, his name wasn't James, his name was Yaakov. He was the chief rabbi of the Messianic uh, movement uh, in 2,000 years ago, and we see that in the book of Acts. And then his brother Jude, knowing that his brother Jacob is so important, says in the beginning of his letter that he is the brother of Jacob. So these guys... You know, were important. And Jude talks about this. He says, you know, when the angels uh, who came and, and, and who did this and, and who were going, you know, were judged by God, and he quotes the book of Enoch, he actually quotes uh, a prophecy about the second coming, what we call the second coming, that is in the book of Enoch. And so, um, you know, he, he quotes that. And that's very interesting that he does that uh, because the book of Enoch must have been a book of importance for him to quote it and for it to be recorded in the canon of Scripture for us to study, okay, this is important. Jude, the brother of the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, in what we consider to be revealed Scripture, points and quotes a book, the book of Enoch, which was understood to be a very important book all the way till then. That's why he's reading it and quoting it. But why is it in the New Testament? Well, this is very important to understand. You know, if this was just a sideshow, what you brought up, if this was just a sideshow, it wouldn't be in the book of, in the New Testament. Why? The New Testament is to be understood as a very, very important document that God, the God of gods, has redeemed the Adamic race, overturned the judgment of death, and is reestablishing Adam in the great assembly of his creation, and the New Testament is here to document how this is occurring and to, for it to be a witness to all the 70 nations that were mentioned in chapter 10 of the book of Genesis. They are all to hear this. This is very important to the whole world. Why would there be passages that talk about these strange activities that occurred before the flood in the writings of Peter and Jude in this most important of documents, unless it was somehow connected to the work of the Messiah? And it is because the fallen world has actually three pillars. The first pillar is what happened in the Garden of Eden and the judgment of death. The second pillar is this corruption that came from the serpent's seed, and the Lord refers to it in the parable of the wheat and tares, where God planted his seed, and while he was sleeping, whatever that means, uh, you know, John, uh, who is with you guys, um, uh, he, he suggested that perhaps it happened on the Sabbath, uh, that Satan then came and planted his seed in the, in, the, in, the, in the garden. And so their tale of two seeds that are planted in the garden is recorded also in the parable of the wheat and the tares. Uh, and the Lord said he would put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. So again, the sperma, that's the Greek word for seed, by the way. Uh, so this is, this, is, this, is, this is there as well. So this was another pillar of the fallen world. This was the second pillar that corrupted the world. Death and the pillars of resurrection, in, in inside of which we have the promise of a new body, the celestial body that Paul talks about in First Corinthians chapter fifteen. This is to undo the mingling of genes. We would say today that have plagued us. We need a new body, and that is why it is mentioned in the New Testament, these events that corrupted us to the point where this new body was needed. And so that's why it is mentioned in the New Testament, because it's connected to the Messiah's work. And the third pillar is what happened in the Tower of Babel, where the nations were cast out of the presence of God. And chapter 12 talks about Abraham, the man in whom you know, the nations would be redeemed, the families of the earth would be blessed. And this is what God says after... Uh, the resurrection, starting with Cornelius and the events with Peter um, on his roof, the visions he has, no, don't call him clean, would have made call clean. So he's talking about these Gentiles who are coming to visit him, that this message, surprise, surprise, is here also for the, so the three pillars of the fallen world, the Garden of Eden, 
Genesis 6 verse 4, the, the introduction of serpent seed and the casting out of Babel, these three things are fulfilled by the Messiah and these three things must be addressed in the New Testament and that's why these absurd, obscure passages exist because they relate to the undoing of the pillars of the, of the fallen world as per the work of the Messiah on earth. So this is, this is important. It, 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 this is not a simple thing. Some, you know, some, now, once we start to read Greek mythology and all that stuff, well, not everything that's in those stories is actually fact. We compare with scripture to understand where the facts lie and say, okay, we know the scripture says that, that there was contact and procreation. Okay, this happened then and afterwards, therefore this is factual, this we, we see. There was a transfer of knowledge, which I'm about to talk about in a second, and, and so this was actual factual, these guys were giving all kinds of knowledge, I see. So so we compare to scripture. Now there's a lot of myth. If you want uh, to, to kind of, you know, yeah, so, um, uh, rummage through the myth and get to the facts even by studying the myth itself, you have to go back to the Mesopotamian writings because they are the original stories that the Greeks and other guys are based on. And when you get to the most ancient uh, um, uh, pantheon, the Sumerian pantheon, that one has actually some very interesting information about even the houses of the fallen angels. They love their symbols. They've divided the earth among themselves, or God has you know, divided the earth and, and given it to their power. So they, they, they have actual houses and, and it seems that they procreate among each other. They don't just procreate with us. So there's, there's, the, there's the children of the fallen angels uh, with each other, uh, like the Queen of Heaven. And so th this, is, um, this is interesting. Yes, there is information in these myths. However, there's a lot of myth as well in this myth. Myths meaning stories that we don't really know what to do with. We don't know their how, how what, what weight to give them. Fine. We take that with a grain of salt, but the Bible is talking about these guys extensively and pointing us into their study. So yes, we 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 realize that there was a genetic connection, but even more uh, encompassing is the paradigm and worldviews that they're creating for us. So this starts in the Garden of Eden, where Satan and Eve have a conversation with each other. And he, Satan says to Eve, what did God say about this tree? So the first commandment of God, yes, they were to attend to God and his, and his commandments. This is why they were put in the garden. Not to attend to the garden, by the way. The Hebrew makes it clear, to attend to God. And, and, and so that's what the rule of Israel is. That's what the rule of the royal priesthood is. And then Eve says to Satan, well, God said, if you eat from this, you will die. Repeating, you know, the, the commandment. And Satan does something very important, and that's there's a reason why it's recorded in Scripture, I think. He says, you shall surely not die. So what does he do? First of all, we have to pause on there. He takes the commandment of God and reverses it. It's what we call a lie. And later on, the Lord in John chapter 8 will say that he's the father of lies. So this is important. Then what does he do? He says, you will become like the gods, like the Elohim. So Satan, is, Eve knew that there was more of them, and he knew he, she wasn't shocked when this, the shining one, the Nachash, the serpent, was talking to her because she knew of these guys, and he was a trusted you know, member of God's. He was the leader of the Kerubim, which we consider to be the highest order as far as uh, what is revealed to us in scripture so he was a really important dude and so he she she trusted him and when he says that you'll be like like well, like us basically like one of the gods it's funny in my one of the bibles uh, uh, that i consulted years ago when i was doing this research it was the schofield bible and there um there was two little brackets around the word gods in this passage you know where satan says you'll become like one of the gods knowing good from evil and it was made singular and the editor wanted me to know that this was their choice. You know, they, they just wanted to point that out, that they didn't feel comfortable to make it plural, just to your point, that the people are uncomfortable with this. So he, what does he do? He lies to her, and then he adds a truth to it, because later on God says, man has become like one of us, knowing good from evil. 
So that was true, that if we ate from that tree, we would become like them. But the lie was that, of course, we would not surely die. So he takes God's commandment, inverses it. That's the lie. And that's the nature of the lie, the inversion of God's commandment. Then he adds a truth to it, which is maybe the glue that holds the lies together. Here God is teaching us the structure of the DNA of Satan's messaging to the Adamic world. Whenever we see the blueprint of this, of God's word being reversed and a truth attached to it, we know where this is coming from because we have been taken to when history was young and there was only two guys and a fallen angel. So it was very easy to see what was happening. Now, they have children and we are told that Satan is the one that deceives the nations. And many people, Many times we are told that in the Bible, including the book of Revelation. So he's the one that deceives the children. The way he deceived Eve, he continues to create this deception. But how does he do it exactly? And that's where this transfer of knowledge is important. Once you realize that the, the gods of the nations were real, and you look into the history of the nations, well, what you see, first of all, is that a tremendous amount of knowledge was passed down. Now, the first time where I saw this was in the book of Enoch. Um, you know, we read Jude talking about the sons of God, the watchers, and, and the Nephilim. And I was like, wow, the book of Enoch, what's that? So I started to, you know, uh, look for a book of Enoch, finally found one. It wasn't easy. Uh, now they're all over the place. But, so the book of Enoch, and it's become very popular again. It was very popular in the 19th century in America to read the book of Enoch. They were just ordering it from Europe like it was going out of style. It was this, this copy that I have, actually, by Richard Lawrence in Oxford University. This translation was people, well, this is the one they wanted. So the book of Enoch talks about what you mentioned, that these 250 guys under the leadership of Samyaza, it, their names are not to be pronounced. I'm only doing it out of you know education. Um, they come down and they, they cohabit with human females. They create uh, royal lines for themselves and they place eventually one of their guys, one of their hybrid offsprings in charge of the world. They create a one world government, the first original one, and it was destroyed by the waters of the flood. They're, since then, they've been trying to do it again. You know, So they then begin to give knowledge. This is now the second point, perhaps in some ways even of greater importance. Um, so we are told that, that, the, that Azazel, who many believe is this another name for the leader, he taught men to make swords, knives, shields, breastplates. Now, that's interesting because what does God's teaching say? God says that the day will come under his Messiah um, that we will take our swords and turn them back into pruning instruments of farming. Right, So we are going to reverse this evil. In the time of the Messiah, these instruments of war will become again those instruments of farming that Adam had at the beginning before the fall. The fabrication of mirrors, he taught, the workmanship of bracelets and ornaments, the use of paint, the beautifying of the eyes, uh, the, the use of stones of every valuable and select kind like jewelry and of all sorts of dyes. So the world became altered, impiety increased, fornication multiplied, and they transgressed and corrupted all their ways. So we see that this was a very strategic knowledge to pervert, you know, God's creation. Now this knowledge, and there's more, I'm going to read it in a second, that was given by different fallen angels to the human race. The human race was not without knowledge, not according to the book of Genesis, because it says that um, Enoch, or Cain, the son of Adam, went and built a city. Well, you don't build a city without the knowledge of architecture. Um, and then we have a whole list of Cain's children. You know, this guy was the first of the musicians, the, the father of all those who play the wind and string instruments. And we see these ancient harps that King David played as well. Then we have um, uh, the ones who lived in tents. This is the first guy, they, like Abraham lived in a tent. Oh, and these tents were, you know, very big, like mash-like tents, like they were houses. And then there's the guy, uh, Tubal Cain, who was the first of the metallurgists. And we have found a, a place in ancient Mesopotamia, a very ancient place. And when you translate the name into English, it's the Valley of Metallurgists. And this is really interesting because 
uh, humanity had knowledge from God. You know, when God says to Adam, go and subdue the world and all that, well, he had to give him knowledge. And, and you know, uh, there are some people who like to reference the writings of, of, the, of the Masons. And I'm going to talk about this uh, later um, because they're part of how this uh, corrupt knowledge continues to come into the world. But the Masons in their writings say that, yes, the, you know, there was the geometria, the knowledge of measuring things. Architectura, these knowledges were handed down by God to Adam and he who taught his children. And some of this knowledge may have come through our genes, you know, like like it's in us, you know, it's like language, you know, you just open your mouth and start talking. So um, there was knowledge, but these fallen angels before the flood, they were now beginning to corrupt that knowledge, to pervert the knowledge that God had given us by putting on a slant. Oh, you know how to make metallurgy, great, but you know how to make swords. Oh, you know, so they they were you know they were starting to corrupt the knowledge. Uh, um, there's another one of these guys. Um, he taught the sorcerers and dividers of roots. Another one taught the solutions of sorcery. And by the way, sorcery in Greek is pharmaceutica. That's that's the translation of the word sorcery in the Greek language, pharmaceutica. So this was you know powerful, powerful. Uh, knowledge solutions of sorcery we're talking what you and i would call chemistry uh, another one of these guys taught the observers of the stars um and we see how important that is you know let's think about the magi um then another one taught signs tamiel taught astronomy by the way just to go back to the observers of the stars i mean god himself said that one of the uh, purposes of the sun and the moon was to be a communication system it was for signaling Ot in Hebrew, it means signals. Um, it's been translated as signs. And Moedim, appointed days, or it's been translated as seasons in most Bibles. So God uh, was going to use the sun and the moon as a system of communication and as well as a way of understanding when is it that very important things in his divine calendar were to occur that would be of importance to us. He, from the beginning, saw that and put that there for us. Yet these guys are perverting it. I mean, some even say that the Maserat, which is the Hebrew word for uh, the constellations, and, and uh, that in it, God recorded the story of salvation with there was, you know, Leo, uh, the Lion of Judah, there's the Virgo, the Virgin, and then there is um, even El Gibor, you know, the, the Orion's uh, belt is around this, this giant, this mighty hunter he's called. He's arrested, you know. And God refers later uh, to himself as the one who created these mighty stars. So um, perhaps some say that God taught Adam uh, in the stars, you know, before writing, he taught Adam uh, about the story of salvation and what he had planned for his children um, by, by creating a story, a tale inside of the heavens. So these guys they were perhaps putting their fingers on all kinds of stuff that God had claimed for himself and perverting knowledge that God had given for our edification. And in with this knowledge, they created a world that God destroyed in, in the flood and there's judgment that fell over them. They were to be arrested and put in chains and Peter talks about this in the New Testament and their hybrid offsprings and the Nephilim, the, the Titans, the Greeks would call them, God ordered these angels to put inside of their hearts the the desire to mutually destroy each other and they did and their spirits were were left alone and that's apparently the origin of demons or evil spirits which are different from fallen angels right they they're they are the shidim they have a different word for them but what's interesting it says in the book of enoch that god said but leave the knowledge for man and so we see that even in the library of Ashurbanipal in 612 BC, even then he's studying still the writings from the days before the flood. So knowledge enters, you know, the human world there. Then the flood occurs and Noah and his children, they kind of, you know, I don't know if they had carted some of this knowledge out in the, in the ark. Um, Others are now suggesting that this knowledge was recorded on these great, great pillars that were hidden and they survived the flood and then they were read again. Knowledge was at the beginning of the post-Diluvian civilization. 
Uh, Noah and his uh, offspring, they started to build using brick and mortar. It says that. Well, it seems easy to say that, but do you know how hard it is to bake brick? Like, you just bake brick. It's not like baking bread, you know, on a little fire. Like, I mean, this stuff was baked at the right temperature to the point where it survived to, to this day. You know, right? we see the stuff that was built. We see the tablets that were made of clay, but they're pretty much indestructible. To get the, the I can never say this word, the kiln, the, little, the oven, hot enough. Um, it requires quite some know-how, and to get it the right temperature requires even more precision. So these guys had knowledge of farming, they had farming instruments, uh, they had the knowledge of um, you know, making bricks and all that stuff out of the flood. But very soon we see that they collect behind a Nimrod, a king, and they collect behind a body of knowledge that, that seems to come from the forces that are behind Nimrod, and they decide to challenge God. When God divides the nations, what happens next? Well, when archaeologists came to ancient Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization in 19th century from Europe, they were shocked at how advanced the cities were that they were discovering. And the more south they went, because they started in, in north of Iraq, which was the Assyrian world, Nineveh was one of the first cities discovered. Then in 1850, the Germans discovered Babylon. And as they were reading these writings, they all talked about an ancient culture that they got their information from to the south. And so the further south they went, the more older the civilization they found. Yet, when they got to the most ancient of the civilizations, the Sumerian one, which is the way that we call the land of Shinar, that the book of Genesis refers to in chapter 11, it says that Noah and his sons they settled once the waters receded. They came from the mountains eventually into the valley, and they settled in the land of Shinar. This civilization was discovered, and it was more advanced than all the other ones. It was clearly the fountainhead of the Babylonian and Assyrian civilization, and it was more advanced. How could you go back in time and find a more advanced civilization? This was a question archaeologists could not answer, and they have not answered to this day. It's called sudden civilization. It seems that civilization suddenly appeared. So it was like, how did they get this? Well, they 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 consulted the writings of these own of the of the guys who were living back then. How did you guys discover all this? They said, well, the gods gave it to us, and and this body of knowledge handed down by the gods were called me m e. You can even read about it on Wikipedia now, in 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 their language. And these were knowledges like, you know, God had given Moses about different types of life, that and how this is how you live, this is how you do commerce, this is how you regulate your culture. And I was like, wow, the gods. And so for them, they thought, well, this, we don't believe in these guys. And, and so an alternative theory was presented by this 20-year, 8-year-old guy, and that became the theory that we're all taught in school and university, which was this, that at the end of the age of farming, uh, one very smart farmer, no, sorry, at the, age, at, the age, at the end of the age of hunter-gatherers, one smart hunter-gatherer, he had this brilliant idea. It was called farming. It just, boom, he, like he woke up on that farming. And as people began to farm and they didn't have to chase for their food, they now were collaborating and they started to benefit from talking to each other and they came up with all these bodies of knowledge like like one guy just ran into the camp and said guys i've discovered something i called architecture another guy ran the camp and said i've discovered something too i call astronomy so this absurd idea that that in a very tiny short amount of time because of, they could sit around fires and talk to each other and not run after their food they came up with this you know with the this is the alternative idea that was presented to us in school because it was just one guy who came up with this. However, the ancient writings left by our collective ancestors, and they were not all crazy, and the writings left to us by the Lord God point to a different version of how reality took shape, which was knowledge was handed down. Now, what kind of knowledge was handed down? Well. First of all, um, there was the knowledge of kingship that was handed down. And we read in the ancient Sumerian tablets that this was first handed down in Eridu before the flood, that kingship came from heaven to earth in Eridu and after the flood in the city of Kish. 
And this is important. Why? Well, anthropologists will tell us that urbanization is when humans stopped uh, forming around clans with a patriarch, like, you know, Abraham, you know, at, on, at the top of it. And they started to form around these cities that had a priest king. That's the beginning of urbanization. Well, what we are told in these writings is that actually the fallen angels empowered one guy in the, in a town and he became their representative he became their priest their high priest and their king and then they built these monuments of te the, these temples called ziggurats so this is interesting because what god does he brings abraham out of the world of all of this and says well i want you to meet my priest the king of jerusalem melech zedek the the righteous king and this is a type of the Messiah, Paul tells us, one who had no uh, origin and one who did not have father, who was not part of a hereditary priesthood. So this is very interesting, this competition between the throne of David, the only legitimate, and this series of kings that the enemy appoints, starting with the, with the beginning of the most ancient of cities and culminating with what we popularly refer to as the Antichrist. So this is one of the types of knowledge that was handed down. Um, then there was uh, the knowledge of, of, of um, mathematics and medicine. You know, there has to be like beneficial knowledge in order to, for you to worship somebody, right? You, they have to heal you. They have to answer your prayers, that kind of thing. But at the heart of all of these knowledges was the laws and commandments of the gods or the fallen angels. Satan is going to deceive the nations, I said. And it, it, the type of it is in the Garden of Eden between the conversation with Satan and Eve. But now how is he actually going to pull this off on the scale of larger nations than just Eve? Well, at the heart of all of this knowledge is the laws of the gods. Now, what is found in these laws? It is found a tale of creation, like the book called Enuma Elish. Which are the great Assyr the, you know we have it in the in the in the Assyrian translation, but it was the great scripture of Mesopotamia. In the Enuma Elish, we have an understanding of who the gods are, are to be worshipped. They are the creature. They are the creation authors. They are going to give us afterlife, and these are their laws. We are to live by them. We are to receive our power and our blessings from them. So they use these writings to to you know point to themselves. And I hate to say it, and I really don't mean any disrespect to anyone out there, because I'm, I'm just speaking truth. It's, it's kind of humans on one side and the gods on the other. And who are these guys? Well, the Bible tells us they're fallen angels, and they're created by God. Fine. But it's more like we're trying to understand what's going on. We're all born in a culture. One of the religions that has survived the onslaught of the Holy Spirit, that which has gone out and pushed away this incredible structure that existed, is Hinduism. Hinduism... It continues to exist in its polytheistic form. It's the only main religion that, you know, exists, uh, survives kind of the movement of the Holy Spirit. And it's very clear uh, when you read the ancient Hindu writings uh, that, the, let's see, look at the Red Veda. I think I have a copy right in the box right here. Uh, one of the most ancient, you know, Vedic texts of India, which is the worship of Indra, who is a titan a nephilim and an air god so he's he's associated with the same type of rank that zeus had well there's a lot of laws and commandments and teachings found in these writings and and and, and you can draw all kinds of stuff out of them you know you can you can find how it, there's a numerology inside of them you can really see this the author of this book was more than just a, a guy so it's very compelling now what are, how, with these laws became the foundation of civilization. Like we say in, at the beginning of the documentary, all the civilizations attribute their genesis to the gods. I mean, you look at it, um, the story of Moses get, get, receiving the laws of God gave birth to the Hebrew civilization. But all the civilizations attribute their genesis to this revelation. I mean, the most recent example from our point of view is Muhammad. In the seventh century of the Christian era, this Arabian guy says, I'm receiving messages from Allah. And boom, who are the Arabs? Well, the Arabs live flanked by two great empires, two ancient civilizations, the Greeks on one side, Byzantium is their capital, and the Persians on the other. 
And the Arabs don't have a writing system. They're an oral culture. It's the 7th century. They're not an imperial force. Yet, they receive this message from Allah, whose symbol is the crescent of the moon. They put this into writing. And writing, by the way, is created you know, in order to capture the words of Allah. Um, they borrow writing systems. But that is the purpose of writing. You know, the ancient Mesopotamian tablets, we have not found any evidence of a gradual writing system. We find the most ancient tablet we have found has 700 tablets, uh, 700 uh, images on it already. But the ancient Mesopotamian tablets tell us that the purpose of writing was to encode the laws of the gods, which are the foundational codes of human civilization. Human civilization gets organized over and over again according to these laws the one that comes from Sinai, and the one that comes from these fallen angels. They actually authored civilization. They didn't just give knowledge about various types of sciences going all the way back to before the flood, and I'll explain in a moment why they're giving this knowledge. And it all has to do with corrupting God's plan and perverting uh, you know, human knowledge and corrupting God's plan, yes. Um, but they didn't just give knowledge about various schools of sciences. They actually gave the very code of civilization, the way that God gave it to Moses. They were competing with God as objects of worship. They were competing with him as far as promising all kinds of stuff to us. I mean, is that the promise of genetics, ultimately, immortality? Is that not the true promise of genetics? Um, on the way to you know many other promises it gives us, oh, it's going to heal us of all of our diseases because we're going to be able to cut and paste our genes uh, as early as in the womb. And beyond that, it's going to give us eventually immortality once we know how to uh, command it not to uh, stop cellular decay. Well, this, this promise is already encoded in these writings that these guys got. You know, when you die, you'll, you'll be resurrected in the realm of the gods. That's what it says in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, one of these very important ancient writings. That the Mesopotamians had their own codes, the Indians had their own codes, the Egyptians had their own code, you know, the Persians had the Avesta, which was uh, the teachings of Ahura Mazda. But there are many gods, even in the Avesta, it is not a monotheistic document. Sometimes you worship only one of the gods, but that didn't make you a monotheist because your god was part of a pantheon. It wasn't like the god of Abraham that had no equal. That was true monotheism. So the promises and the codes of civilization, and you look at the Code of Hammurabi, very important ancient law document. You can Google it and you see the sun god who the Mesopotamians called Shams. We tend to call him by his Greek name, Apollo. The sun god, there's a statue um, and there, he's sitting on a chair, and he's handing a scroll to this man who's standing before him, and that's Hammurabi. And underneath the statue, you have in cuneiform writing, in the, all in the wedge writing, all the law of Hammurabi recorded. And I have seen this tablet myself, because there's two copies left of it in the world. One is in the Louvre Museum of Paris, and the other one is in the Museum of Pre-Islamic History in Tehran, the capital of Iran. And that's where I saw it. So this is this is an example. You know, these laws are very important. They continue to be part of the fabric of our culture. In the age of the Holy Spirit, when God promoted the Bible to all the nations, the commandments of Moses and and you know started to become part of the legal systems of Christian countries. To this day, and, and this was. To, to push back these instructions that God had provided in his writings that were now to be established in the New Testament age. You know, these writings, these commandments that came from the Torah that were to be now established in the New Testament age among all the nations, was to push back against the corruption of reality that had come through the commandments and teachings and laws of the gods who we now knew were in fact what Christians have always referred to as the fallen angels. So they had not only seeded the earth with their own bloodline, which was meant to create A, a royal line, B, it was to create a new race. I and mean, the contamination before the flood was total. Only Noah was uncontaminated. And this is where we're headed right now. In my new documentary, Goliath Rising, you know, I'm documenting the massive contamination that has happened right now in our culture. Uh, of, of this, uh, uh, the hybrids, they're all over the place. They're huge, actually. So 
you know, I don't want to make them bigger than they are. Uh, you know, they're always on the losing side. Uh, the, the 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 Titans and the Nephilim, they're always losing in the whole of scripture. Abraham defeats them. David defeats them. Joshua defeats them. Um, uh, the son of uh, God will defeat them and is coming. They're always on the losing side. And, and we're a lot more numerous than them. But still, their influence is very real. But bigger than this influence was these paradigm creations. These guys were creating worldview for us and trapping our thinking inside of their worldview the way Eve's mind was trapped. And you look at the American dollar bill, and you have on the back of it uh, this pyramid, the, and you have the eye, and, and this is, yes, an Illuminati symbol, the most secretive of all the secret societies. We don't know anything about them. Um, but what do we know? What we do know is that on there, they're using the symbol of the sun god, right? It just kind of shows the allegiances. And what does it see underneath it in Latin? Novus. Ordo Secularum, the new secular order. It is announcing the very order, the very mind, the very paradigm that is to govern the mind and thinking of the sons of this republic, secularism. And what's secularism? Well, it's a religion, but it disguises itself as non-religion. It has an aim and a target. It claims to have no aim and no target to be empirical and scientific, yet its aim is the word of God. It replaces God's, you know, story of creation with another myth, with a myth. Uh, you know, Darwin's idea is promoted as the creation myth of secularism. It draws from materialism, David Hume's idea, which is that, you know, we can only believe in what we see. It rewrites history, pushes back, you know, things such as the account of the Titans being real or even the gods of the ancient world having any reality. It blinds us to all of these things and then guides us it opens our minds to be guided to other types of thinking about who we are, about life, about where we're going. Other parts of the world have alternative worldviews than the one that God is teaching through his word, uh, as well, you know, governing their paradigms. And so you, you see all around the world, in the ancient world, it was total. I mean, the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Chinese, the Indians, they all had very, very tightly controlled worldviews. Only, you know, the Jews who were benefiting from this relationship they had with God, they were receiving God's teachings. When the age of the Holy Spirit came and it became time to call the nations back to the living God, to undo what happened in the Tower of Babel, and to bless the families of the earth and the seed of Abraham. When that time had come, the Holy Spirit poured out into the nations and pushed back this knowledge and brought the light of God, but yet not fully for two reasons. One, there's a time and place for different parts of God's word, it seems, to really be featured. Uh, there was a lot of you know, emphasis on, on, on how we connect with God or salvation. You know, we hear that in the Protestant church all the time. You got to be saved. And how do you get saved? Well, you get saved because you believe that the Lord died for your sins and came back to life on the third day. Hallelujah. Yes, that's a very important piece of knowledge. Yet there's a lot more that is found in the Word of God, and and you know there, there's there's this this I, this pushes back the so there all, not all of the knowledge of, that God has given us is all apparent at once. And the second reason why God's revelation hasn't completely penetrated you know everyone's and all the schools of thought is because there is an enemy that continues even in the age of the Holy Spirit to give its teachings even though it's been pushed back and pushed down, yet it has fought back and replaced, you know, God's teachings with alternative religions and alternative worldviews. Some are overtly distinct. Others are disguised um, inside of the Christian world um, it, to appear in the case of secularism as a non-religion, or in other cases, the attack is even inside of the body of the Messiah. Like in, in the example, again, and I don't mean to offend anyone, but I think that Catholicism, who it may have some great teachings from the Lord in it to this day, but it continues to also have a heavy dose of something other than the Word of God in it. It has to be said. And so the enemy is inside, um, in the culture, inside of the body, 
and even in distinct cultures outside of it that have been defeated where Christianity was pushed back hundreds of years ago, the movement of the Holy Spirit has stopped and alternative religions created. So this idea of creating these paradigms, these deceiving the nations, how does it happen? Well, it happens through the creation of alternative religions, alternative priesthoods that are energized, empowered, and houses of kingship that support this pseudo-religion that Satan is creating for humans. We see that also in um, um, the, uh, wait, so I saw a question that came online, and I'm sorry, reading it, sorry. Uh, we see, and we'll get to the questions for sure, they all seem very interesting. Uh, we see this alternative uh, creation you know, of, of reality compared to the word of God. Um, actually, I lost my train of thought, so forget that. And um, so we, we are seeing um, this battle between, you know, these bottom, the other way that it's created, well, in the case of secularism, so the, these orders, first of all, these secret societies, well, they are not outside of this story. There are only two sides to this story. The knowledge that comes from God and the knowledge that comes from the fallen angels. And, and then there's the third type of knowledge, one could say, the one that comes from man himself because man is a thinking being. And these three knowledges um, combine together. They are the pillar and foundation of all knowledge that exists. Knowledge that comes from God through the scriptures and through the Holy Spirit, through the revelation that's given by God through angels. Knowledge that comes from the fallen angels to the nations, which is both religious and scientific, we would call it. And I'm gonna break that down more in a second. And the third knowledge, the knowledge of man himself, thinking. These three knowledges form the basis of all knowledge that holds our minds and realities together. Then in cosmopolitan centers like cities, like New York, like Toronto, like big cities, these three knowledges combine together as people talk to each other and exchange and take pick and choose what they like and become, come under the influence of different types of thinking. They combine to create a fourth body of knowledge which is the combination of all three put together. And this fourth body of knowledge is very popular in cities. In various cultures around the world, still one body of knowledge tends to be dominant uh, based on, you know, depending on where you are. But all the knowledge you see around you can be traced to these three sources. They come or from God or from the fallen angels or from man himself. So they, they don't, don't just seed the earth with their own, you know, bloodlines and genetics material and seed and whatever you, sperma. They seed the earth with their ideas. And they seed it with two purposes. One, to lie and corrupt and confuse. Now, why is this God allowing this? Uh, God is allowing this because he says that those who seek me diligently will find me. Now, if the knowledge of the truth was super obvious, then everyone would turn to God just for mere survival. You don't want to die forever. You, know, you don't want to go to hell. You, of course, you, you're going to turn to God. You may not believe in God in your heart. You may not love him. You may not care for the truth, as many people have discovered don't. Um, but you still go that way because, you know, what's, what's the other choice? But by giving choice, by murking the waters of the human world, what is being filtered out is those who truly seek God, those who truly have a heart for truth. They are now, they have now an enigma to solve because it's like there's this types of, you know, bodies of knowledge that comes from different places. Um, so we see after the time of the Holy Spirit, when the worship of the gods is pushed back, how these influence creeps back in. Sometimes it takes the shape of monotheism where an alternative religion appears that says, hey, no, wait, I have the truth. I truly believe in one God, and I have the truth. And then in its writings, it combats you know, the truths of God and creates an alternative perspective. Remember, there are two spirits released into this earth after the time of the Messiah, the Holy Spirit, and the spirit of the pseudo-Messiah, or as we say in Greek, antichristus, which means pseudo-Messiah instead of the Messiah. There are two spirits, right? And these two spirits that are fighting with each other for the past 2,000 years, this, this battle between the two spirits forms the DNA of history. 
the entire history of the past 2,000 years is the manifestation of the battle of these two spirits. And out of it comes revelation. You see, the Holy Spirit reveals to us, and these other, this other spirit reveals us. So they create alternative religions, send fallen angels into the body very early on. You know, Paul says in the Corinthians, I would not have you be beguiled as Eve was because Satan can present himself as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of unrighteousness. He's writing to a body that believes in the Messiah and he says to them, you've been infiltrated, my brothers, by the enemy. Not, not to make people paranoid. Now you don't want to point to you know people to be, you know. however, it is good to be somewhat paranoid um, in a battle like this. I was watching this. Um, there's a show that Sid Roth, who you may know, uh, he has a show called It's Supernatural. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Um, Sid Roth, and he's a messianic. Um, in 1998, I think, he was uh, filming a show about what was happening around Bethel, which is a church in California. And Bethel is around an area called Mount Shasta, which is considered to be the most sacred mountain to Satan worshippers. It is there are 20 headquarters of 20 different satanic cults around that mountain in that area where this church is, the Bethel church. So they get a lot of people who come from these covens of you know Satan worshiping families. They come to Bethel, you know, and they 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 get saved. And um, the one of these interview he was interviewing one of these ex Satanists, uh, and you know she was born in a family. Who practiced Satan worship like she was born into it. And um, these guys um, were, uh, were clearly, um, again, I lost the thread of my thought. It's interesting. Sometimes the, you know, I, I do think that the enemy attacks. Um, the, these, these guys um, um, were, anyways, I'll come back to it. So, um, oh yes, the, these guys, w w this woman, when she was asking about the, he was asking about her parents, like, what did your parents do? And she said, you know, my father was an elder in a Bible-believing Southern Baptist church. This guy was a practicing Satan worshiper. Like, they actually practiced animal sacrifice at home. I mean, human sacrifice at home, human sacrifice. This guy was an elder in a Baptist church, right? So when, when Paul says to Satan, to, to the Corinthians, that you know some of his ministers, the ministers of unrighteousness, have penetrated, have entered the body in Corinth, be aware, you know, don't listen to them. Well, this has been going on since a very long time. I would even argue that 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 Israel was in, was was you know a had these guys in it. I mean, they were arguing the Pharisees, you know, they were, some of them came to faith, like Nicodemus, like uh, Joseph of Arimathea, like Paul. But the Sadducees, not, ne never see in the Bible, Sadducees come to faith in the Lord. Um, and, and he does, you know, in John chapter 8, he really says, you are the children of the devil, and, you know, you you you're, you're hate me, and, like he hated me, and and he, you, you're, he was a murderer and, and, and a liar. And it's like, wow, who is he talking to? Who is he saying this to? Um, so there may, this may have been a showdown at high noon uh, between, uh, you know, you look at the, the Psalm 22, uh, where in you know, the Lord on the cross, he says, Eli, Eli, lahi sabachthani, um, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a quotation taken from Psalm 22. So when you go back to Psalm 22 and read the whole thing, because the Jewish people would memorize the Psalms based on the first lines, they didn't, they, it wasn't yet divided in numbers. When you read the whole thing, you realize, wow, this is a prophecy given to King David about the Messiah on the cross, looking down. And what does he say? He's surrounded by the bulls of Bashan. Now, where was Bashan? Bashan was the great city of the Nephilim king Og according to the book of Deuteronomy, at the foot of Mount Hermon, which is the mountain where the fallen angels landed before the flood and began their original covenant um, with the nations. So th this, this when it says the bulls of Bashan, is it just like saying that because, yeah, well, scripture just throws things? In, or, is it, or is it that scripture is very precise? It's pointing that at the foot of the cross, the enemies 
soldiers existed. I'm not talking about the Roman soldiers here. I'm talking about the bulls of Bashan, whoever they may have been, because Bashan it was one of the great cities and regions of the Nephilim after the flood of these titans, of these bloodline of the sons of God and daughters of men, of the fallen angels and men. So this is this is an ancient story. It may go back to the time of Israel. Paul talks about it. We see it today in the church. And you know, the Satanist was saying, yeah, my parents were in the church. So um, this is this is something, another attack. So it's alternative religions, and then they have this inside. But then it starts to move forward towards this imperial thirst to recreate not only worldview, but empire. And that's when we see the sciences coming to life again. I and mean, we see it in the Muslim world, all kinds of incredible sciences. Like anything that has AL comes from the Muslim world, algebra, alchemy. Right, A A L is the in Arabic. Right, anything in English that has A L at the beginning is a body of knowledge that, that the Crusaders, you know, were able to take from the Muslim world into the Western world. And then you have these, you know, secret societies. Um, it's interesting because right now I'm really researching these societies, and I, I was invited uh, to someone's house. This woman that I'm ministering to, uh, and she's really had a huge awakening in her faith. Um, through the Bible studies that she's attending, so she invited us uh, to her house with her husband. She, my whole family went over to have dinner, and then we were there, and there was one other guy there. I get there, and there's one other guy, and he's the friend of the husband, and we sit down, and the conversation starts, and then, you know, I realize that he's a Mason, and he's wearing, you know, the, the Masonic uh, emblem, and he's got the ring on, and he's a very well-dressed uh, in, in, individual. This is, you know, and th this is a I think this house is like worth several million dollars. Like this, the, you know, and we're sitting there, and and so I started to talk to him about you know what is it you know that that that's coming, and, and I said to him, apparently there's these you know spiritual forces that are the source of the revelation um, of the knowledge that, that you guys are learning. He, he was surprised that I knew that. He said, yes, yes, they are called the. Um, unknown ones, that's what he called them, the unknown ones. He said they appear only to the highest ranking of us. Um, and I was like, well, what do you guys learn? Uh, how do you progress in, in your, you know, you know Masonic levels? And, and he, he told me the whole history of Masonry and, you know, Scottish Rites is the one that has the most spiritual information. And after the English came over Scotland, they asked to be Masons. And Masonry was divided into two. The most, you know, uh, incredibly powerful knowledge went underground a more watered down version was given to the English. And he was explaining all, he was a kind of historian. He was climbing the ranks and he was telling me that he's just getting ready to, he's asked to, to be initiated to a whole new series of hierarchy. I'm like, well, what do you do? He says, well, we have to memorize information. And then we, we, there's a ritual and we have to explain the information we've memorized, recite it, and then perform the ritual. And then we can go to the next level. And it's a lot of hard work. Like you really got to study this. And I'm like, well, what kind of information is this? Oh, he said, well, I'm bound by oath. I can't tell you. I'm like, well, you know, like, tell me. He said, well, none of the scientific discoveries would have come without this information. I'm like, really? He's like, I'm like, what? He's like, well, for instance, gravity. I'm like, are you telling me Newton was a, was a Mason? He's like, yeah. And I thought, well, that's interesting because, you know, one of the things that I talk a lot about is the heavens, Shemaim, uh, Uranus in the New Testament. And, you know, this whole thing that in the Bible there is the chariots of Adonai, the, char the heavenly chariots of God that, you know, because I had a very close-up UFO sighting that started me down this path. And people have difficulty. They go, well, are you saying that God is like an alien? I'm like, no, no, it's not true. Then other Christians will, will try to say, oh, well, it comes from another dimension. Like somehow that's supposed to make it more, more like magical because we're trying to re rediscover our inherited perspectives well, I thought, wait a second, where does the concept of the universe come from? Well, I know that Galileo did a lot, like he gave us a telescope, which allowed us to look into the heavens. I'm like, but what if he was a mason? So I look him up, and yes, he was a very famous mason, Galileo. I'm like, whoa. So this body of knowledge that's coming to us um, through these secret societies that have these very prominent members who given foundational ideas that open their brain to discovering things it's interesting the discovery is about actual facts i mean if i drop this pen it does actually fall right however this information is not presented to us as a fact 
placed in God's creation, an alternative way of looking at reality comes with it. So we're no longer in the heavens and on the earth, we're in the universe. Oh, what's the universe? Well, the universe is a place full of aliens. Oh, really? Okay. So suddenly our perspective, and it's like, we don't believe it? Here, stick this telescope on your eye, and you're like, wow, right? So, so it comes with a worldview, and now it's like we, we get confused, and we see all of these you know, heavenly chariots, and we go, well, what's this? And this can't be aliens, so they come from our dimension, because we're all, we have a confused notion of reality, but because it's mixed with facts, it's hard to dismiss, right? Because they're actual facts coming with it, right? Oh, these are your genes. Where are genes? Well, genes are these mutations that happen when we came out of the waters of the primordial goo. And it's like, wow, I mean, okay, because they discovered the genes. Maybe that's true. So it comes with an actual story, and it comes from these um, societies that are formed in, in secret and darkness around these beings who are revealing this information to the elders. And you look at, for instance, you know, so, um, American universities, starting with Harvard, they all have secret societies in them. They're very important places. Select people are allowed in. No one knows what happens inside. You can't go in the building. They give lots of money to the university. Many of these graduates end up in places of influence in the Congress, in the Senate, in the presidency. I mean, Bush, um, um, Kelly, um, they both belong to the secret society at Yale, a skull and bones. It's become you know one of the more famous ones. Um, so it's like, okay, what is it that goes in their minds? And when do they, do they, like for instance, I've been studying alien abductions uh, since the mid-1990s. And I can tell you that there are some information put inside of people's mind that is meant to be triggered at a certain point in time. Because even under hypnosis, where the mind relaxes and subconscious is released, this information doesn't come up. They, they say, you know, they whispered something to me, and I don't remember it, even, even though they're remembering the whole thing now. But that information they can't remember. So it's, it's hard to know, like, what is being, but, you know, this man I met, I believe it was God's will because I'm researching all of this, and suddenly I meet a guy who's, like, in there, and he's willing to talk. You know what? I did push him and push him and push him and say, no, please just tell me, like, what was the last thing you had to memorize? And he said that it was a parable of Christ's. And I was like, really? He's like, I, he said, yes, but I was given its true meaning. It's true interpretation. I'm like, well, okay. I'm like, what was that about? He said, well, it was about how humans should connect with other humans. And I thought, this is interesting. Like, the, the, the idea is that he goes around with a new way of connecting people, of changing the fabric of society. I mean, look at something like political correctness. Where did that come from? Because at the beginning, you know, I was there. I was a teacher when political correctness started. So I was like, I could I would experience the entire wave of the whole thing covering us i was there I mean, everyone was talking about it at first it was about like you don't use uh terms that may may have meant something a long time ago but now are really pejorative diminutive bad terms you know you don't say to someone you're retarded you say you're mentally challenged okay because retarded comes from the French word retard which means to be late and the idea is that the brain develops a little bit slower than most people, but in our culture, it's come to mean backwards, right? So let's not use that word anymore. This was like an example. Okay, this seemed like a nice idea, but very quickly it leapfrogged to saying that entire systems of thought were politically incorrect. So entire teachings from God were suddenly put inside this category and you were not allowed to adhere to them or you were, you were bad. It was like, whoa, that was quite a leap. And we were all wondering what's going on. I mean, people were talking about. It. I remember walking in a coffee shop as I was, but I was getting lunch to attend the Bible study, and I walk into this coffee shop to get this lunch, and there is these three guys sitting down talking about this. And one of them said to the other one, "Soon it's going to be politically incorrect to believe in God." And I thought, "Wow, everyone, I mean, this was how." And then on TV, I've googled this many times. I can't find it, but I I remember watching this on TV. There was a uh, news uh, guys in front of Harvard, and these guys were saying from Harvard that political correctness was created by them as a social experiment. 
and thrown into the culture. And it's like, okay, where did that idea come from? So these guys inspire ideas. Or let's say, for instance, the guy who created, the, who, who came up, Watson and Crick, who came up with a double helix nature of DNA. They found, they discovered that, and they won a Nobel Prize. Well, Watson said that they're researching it forever, could not find it. And one day, the idea came to him while he was driving to work. And Francis Crick, he wrote a book afterwards saying that human DNA was different from all other DNA on the earth. And he believed that it no longer, that it didn't come from earth. And he introduced the idea of panspermia. He had the very strange idea that, that cosmic garbage was flying through space because some other culture threw its garbage in space. And part of it landed on earth. And that's where human DNA came from, alien garbage. So... But but again, I mean, these are powerful ideas coming from people who discovered the double helix nature of DNA, writing books about it. Where did their idea come from? So this thing that's on the American dollar bill, the new secular order, well, you have to create school system. You have to create universities. You have to train politicians to pass laws. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not like you go to bed, you wake up in the morning and everyone in America is secular. No, it's going to take centuries, and it's going to take time, and it's going to take organization, it's going to take dedication. But again, who is behind all of this movement? Well, the gods. So what we see is that in the civilized empire, not only is the laws of the gods prominent as to what we're supposed to believe in worldviews, but the sciences that give us power. Uh, the one that Enoch, you know, documents, the first scribe of God, Enoch says he was the first scribe of God, the first guy who was given the knowledge of writing to encode God's words for us. He talks about these bodies of knowledge given to humanity to pervert. And we see these bodies of knowledge um, exist after the flood, and they are what these civilizations cherish, what is the source of their power, you know, and, and, and this is passed down from Mesopotamia to Persia to Greece to Rome. From there, it populates Europe and, and comes back to life. And then it's carried into the new world, into the colonies here. And it continues to be extend, expanded on. Why? Why? Well, this is where we get into the prophetic. Where is it all going? We have two things ahead of us. Uh, one is to buy into the enemy as our God. This is one of their desires. And they need to, 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 to give us lots of goodies. As I said, I believe that immortality through genetics is one of the main goodies. Um, th there is an alternative reality. It's been created through technology in the digital age. Uh, transhumanism has many manifestations. Um, and we're going towards this society of uh, cyborgs where technology is going to be incorporated in us. I mean, let's face it, I walk around with my phone all the time. I'm never going to put something like that in my body. But I mean, you know, it's so they're giving us lots of gifts. You look at, for instance, um, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Stephen Greer. Um, he's this guy who's collected all of these testimonies from high ranking military and government officials about alien encounters, UFOs. And he says, you know, they're going to give us gifts to solve the problems of famine. I believe the environment is going to be a huge uh, lie uh, when it comes to the lies, because I hear it all the time in abduction stories all, all over the world. They're going to solve the environment problem. And I think that's why they've made the environment such an issue, because they're going to give us some sort of, a, you know, toys to solve these issues. And so it's about winning us over. Uh, and creating a culture in their image. You know, we're going to be connected to their system. We're going to be connected to, through their system, to the leader. You know, we're going to have, you know, it's like the Holy Spirit connects us to God. And, and so they're creating a, a culture in their own image, and they're giving us lots of knowledge um, a, to win us over and to create a civilization for us. And they've been doing this, even the plow apparently was given by Enlil, you know, that's what the ancient texts record, um, who was one of the, uh, perhaps Satan himself actually. And then the second purpose they're giving it to us, I believe, is to prepare us to do battle with the Lord God. I mean, it's crazy, but it says that in the Bible in several places, it says that the nations are going to go to war against God 
It gives a physical location for it. The valley of Armageddon is the epicenter of this war. It provides all sorts of det details about it. It's not like the Bible doesn't say one good day God arrives and he snaps his fingers and everyone's guns are put down. The fallen angels are frozen and he takes over uh, and, and well, he's able to receive the scepter of rule from the father, but then he just starts ruling out of Jerusalem. No, it says that he comes over and it describes war, bloody war, like it describes blood. You know, his his garments are made red as he as he uh, squeezes the wine press of the wrath of God. I mean, you, you've heard that song, I'm sure. Um, so this is um, this is what's been described. But what would make the world go to war against God? In our documentary, we speculated, as other people who interviewed did, that. It was by casting God as an alien. So this 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 knowledge that's coming in in, in the the UFOs. Okay, um, it, we speculated uh, it was just a conjecture, of course. But in our 2006 documentary, we speculated that um, the fallen angels were presenting themselves under a new light. They were no longer the gods. That was not the mask. The new mask was where your friendly aliens. And it's interesting because. You look at the UFO phenomenon with alien abductions and the creation of hybrids, which we've documented, it's very dark. But the propaganda is that the savior of the world have arrived. And we see this propaganda as early as the late 40s. Um, and we see it you know, immortalized in that movie, The Day the, the Earth Sits Still, I think it was 1951 or 52. So we see that from the beginning, the message of the UFO world is that the saviors of the world have arrived because it says that the final world leader is going to do miracles. It's going to, he's going to make fire come from the sky. He's going to do lying signs and wonders. Well, how is he going to do all of this? And who was it that wanted fire to come from the sky? Elijah and the prophets of Baal. But this time, you know, it's like the prophets of Baal, they, they finally connected a few thousand years late. They're like, come on, send fire. Finally, you know, it does come. So these guys may even come out of the clouds and appear behind him. Um, he may call upon them to give gifts to us and healing of the environment and all kinds of, you know, great things. Let's world, let's end poverty let's end world famine. Let's turn water that is made of salt into water that's drinkable at no cost at all. Here, take this gizmo, put it in there. But ultimately, they're giving us the technology that we need in order to prepare us for the battle of God Almighty. You see in the book of Daniel, these two angels that went at it, the one that came from the heavenly council and the one that was behind the Persian empire, they had comparable force. If the one from heaven was so much stronger that he could just pulverize the prince of Persia, then he wouldn't have to get stuck for 21 days and call for backup. But he had to. And these forces are not just the way that we'd imagined it. You know, we had taken the spirits, the demons, and we've made them the encompassment of all of the fallen angels. So when we think of this spiritual battle, we only think of it in the world of prayer and the world of spirit. And that battle is very real. I'm not saying it's not. I fight it all the time. However, these guys are actually like us in the heavens and on the earth, they are talking, they are feeling. I mean, the leader of the fallen angels here who came before the flood, Sam Yeza, he says um, that um, the I, um, he says, then the leader Sam Yeza said to them, I fear, I fear that you may perhaps be indisposed. The guy feared, feared. He had that emotion that he would be the only one found guilty of such a grave a sin. So he had a concept of the commandments of God. He had a concept of sin. He had a concept of fear. He, and all these other guys said, no, we'll swear with you. So we'll take responsibility with you. So um, they're much, you know, they're in the world like we are. And, and they're a different order of beings. As I said, they're spirit beings, but they're also physical beings. I don't know exactly how their body is made up, but we are made in the image. You know, they're, they walk around with two hands and two feet and talking stuff. That's what the alien abduction phenomenon points to as well. Since these are fallen angels, it's giving us a glimpse into some of them, how they look, what they look like. So, uh, and you can see that in our documentary, UFOs, Angels and Gods, that you can watch for free on YouTube now. 
Um, this, this whole um, phenomenon is leading, perhaps they're giving us the technology that we need, that is from their perverted knowledge, they're taking the talents we have and, and accelerating it in order for the nations to actually be able to put up a short and brief fight with the angels of God at the second coming, the way the Prince of Persia was able to fight this angel from heaven. So it's to create an alternative civilization, it's to create, to give us gifts, to win us over, and to present themselves as saviors of the world, but also, I think, to prepare us for the great battle. And that's why 100 years ago, it seems that knowledge just took off. You know, we're, we're like walking around, we're going around with our horse buggy and chariots, like the house, a little house in the prairies. And next thing you know, we're like, boom, flying in the heavens. You know, it was that uh, Elon Musk just sent up the most powerful rocket that we've ever sent up, and he's getting it ready for landing on Mars. And um, and then, you know, he, he goes up, and then he comes back down and lands. And I know some people will say, well, this is all just show and fake and conspiracy. Well, <laughs> these guys, it says that the heavens was made for the angels and the earth for man, and these heavenly angels who have come to the earth they are giving us the ability to to go into the heavens because they have this crazy ambition to mingle themselves with those who are made in the image of god to pervert and to claim for themselves that was which was made for the image of god and to encompass to bring us up on board in their revolution and to carry their revolution into the heavens remember it's not outer space we don't know what is this thing in which we find ourselves we don't it's crazy to think about it but we don't actually know where we are because we don't know where the heavens is or we know the earth is in the heavens we know that that you know we're here but where is here we don't know so we don't actually know where we are which gives which creates a gap in our thinking that the fallen angels are filling with their own ideas that they're giving us so their science comes with a great cost. It comes with a worldview that alters our perspective of reality. And it's a very precise worldview. Like in the Garden of Eden, it is the kind of worldview that corrupts the teachings of God specifically and replaces it with alternative reality. Every aspect of God's teachings, all kinds of things that are in God's word, even the community of God, you know, is, is replaced with an alternative community in some religions that form around the worship of another deity. Um, so it's not, it's worldview, what happens to you after death. Well, if it's not through the Messiah, you ain't going anywhere after death of interest. So, you know, it's, this is important. And all of these gifts and knowledges that they're giving us, they're, they're giving us to build their own kingdom and to prepare us for war they're not giving it to us to build the kingdom of God. So 100 years ago, when this knowledge begins to increase, is because, I think, God perhaps, you know, I know, again, some people don't agree with this, but I think God begins to call some of the house of Jacob back to the covenant land, and this gives the signal that we are entering that time, the time that will lead to Jerusalem becoming the city of cities. And so they start to pour out this knowledge in the West, especially because that's where the throne of Satan is in now in Berlin, which again is put there at the end of the 19th century. And we talked about this on the last show. And it is the West that is to be the great empire of the world. And so it needs all of this knowledge. So the same knowledge, bodies of knowledge we've seen before the flood er, reappear through these scientists and uh, people who many of them now I'm realizing are actually Masons and who belong to these secret societies who was written they're receiving inspiration some you know some of the big guys on top me get the chance to meet one of these but much of the teachings is handed down generationally through these writings of inspiration that came from the fallen angels so it's a very important revelation to realize that not only the gods of the nations were fallen angels but they had given, starting from the days of Enoch, a huge amount of knowledge to these nations to compete with the knowledge that God was giving Israel and the house of rulership, the, the house of David, and the temple of Jerusalem, the light of God and the rule of God. Um, 
this was to be you know challenged by the fallen angels and so the world was corrupted because our thinking and our perception of reality was corrupted and this is how satan deceived the nations through these alternative bodies of knowledge and their priesthoods and their books and their rulers and this is what the lord has been you know tearing apart since in the past 2000 years as his spirit has been you know being poured into the nations and people have been awakening and as he has allowed satan to say all kinds of things about the truths of the bible yet god has never allowed satan to destroy his word he said heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not and as his words are read and taught throughout the nations we our minds open up to what's happening outside of our windows and this unveiling uh, to help us understand who, because, you know, God was teaching us about the UFO phenomenon and its place in the end times, but he had to kind of build it up, build it for us from scratch so we understood, follow the breadcrumbs through history, that these guys didn't just appear. They were here behind the nations from the beginning. This is who they were. This is what they call themselves. And this is now how they're reinventing themselves. And they are giving a message of hope, which is a false hope, to the world as they gave messages of hope to the people of the nations who perished not knowing God uh, and being obstructed from knowing God by these beings who David says in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 97, verse 9, worship, uh, Psalm 97, verse 7, worship him, meaning God, all ye gods. So they are commanded to worship the God of gods, actually. Yet they they, they, they don't. They, they want to be worshipped themselves. So this is a very important unveiling of scripture that brought the forces that are behind the nations out for us in order to make the UFO phenomenon make sense. Now we knew, following from ancient history uh, into the modern world, what this presence was and why is it that we could say that they're going to be continued to give us messages because there was an entire um, history of the fallen angels giving messages to us, giving knowledge to us, going all the way back to the conversation between Eve and Satan, where it all started, the deception of the nations. Wow, thank you so much for just walking us through really a comprehensive look um, historically uh, through the lens of scripture, of course, at these entities, um, that's, you know, this is the original conspiracy, truly. Yeah. Um, and it's not conspiracy, you know, it, it's conspiracy fact is what it is. Um, yeah. And uh, just really fascinating. Um, we have an enormous amount of questions that have piled up and I'd like to get to them. Um, and uh, the first question is coming in from Cesar and he's asking, do you think humanity were the third part of the angels that somehow remained neutral in the rebellion of Satan and were condemned on earth because God hates lukewarm or impartial that heaven and hell is a condition or earth on earth or is mankind a separate creation? Um, well, I think that scripture uh, lays a pretty clear picture for us uh, of who the cast of characters are. And there is God and there is this council and one third of these guys uh, especially the group that's called the sons of God has rebelled. And this stuff happened even before Adam came into the picture. And then man was added. And then man was given a choice. And everyone went with the sons of God, it seems, and the fallen angels. Abraham was selected out by God to be the source of the establishing of God's teachings into the nations. Um, as far as the teaching of lukewarm and all that stuff, that comes from one of the letters that the Lord wrote to uh, the churches in, in the book of Revelation, um, that had to do with their relationship to him. Yes, it had to do with their faith. But to take that passage out of context and to apply it to the cosmic tale of the Bible is not a very good way of dividing the Bible. That teaching had to do with the, the condition of Christians uh, and the heart condition that they can have vis-a-vis uh, -vis their Savior. Um, but the cast of characters, man, the fallen angels, the angels of God, the council in heaven, God, the spirits, all of these things are very clearly laid out. And so I'd have to say no. Um, the, the way that we have been talking about it in the past hour is, is more like the way that scripture, I think, divides reality. And he was wondering if um, if heaven and hell is a condition on earth or is this a, um, something that's coming or 
Um, I guess that's kind of what the question was tying into is, is heaven and hell a condition on earth is what he's asking. Um, well, no, the, the, the time that we are given, the short time that we have been given here in, in life is we are not in heaven nor in hell. Um, we are in a place of discovery of choices and, and God has given us two choices like he did uh, with the ancient Israelites, the, the curses and the blessings. On one side, we can choose to be seduced by the knowledge and teachings of the fallen angels. On the other side, we can turn to, to him and humble ourselves before God, repent from our sins, receive his atonement through his son and his Holy Spirit, which gives us light. And then the choice that we make tells us whether we're going to go to heaven or hell, which is a place for our souls. Uh, and so, yes, definitely I would have to say that it's not here. It's in the world to come, but here is a place of choices and discovery. All right. Our next question is, um, according to some, the angels are Nordic looking and they have material bodies of flesh and bone, but lack blood. And the angels that fall have to drink blood or something derived from grapes, perhaps. And is it possible that why the angel the angel that fought with Jacob had to leave before morning was because it was similar to what we know as vampires? Um, well, no. I mean, a lot of ideas here have been mixed together. Um, the um, Let me break them down. The Nordics are hybrids. They are not angels uh, per se. They are Nephilim. They are titans. They are hybrids. Um, they are the offspring of fallen angels. As far as them not having blood, I don't know. That's the first I ever heard of it. Blood is the stuff of life, and they've taken of our genes. Um, uh, so I think they do have blood. Now, the gods, they had to eat something to stay immortal, and that's very interesting because we are told that there is a tree of life, uh, and that has been barred to us. But at the very end of the story of the Bible, when all the things that were made wrong in the first three chapters are made right, uh, we again get to partake from the tree of life. So perhaps there is something that sustains the immortals uh, throughout the eons where they live, and perhaps the fallen angels did need something to give them the longer lifespans that they have. And perhaps that's what these myths uh, of the Greeks were pointing to. Again, I don't know because these are just ideas, but you know, they're, it's interesting to think about. And I think there's a third point the question made. Um, so there was the hybrids, the, the, the Nordiques, the, the fallen angels and their, the gods and their nectar. And there was another point I forget. Um, the uh, They were asking if um, these ancient beings are similar to what we know as vampires. Is oh. that the reason right. that the angel had to leave in the morning um, when it was wrestling with Jacob before the morning? Um, no. So the angel that was wrestling with Jacob, we are told, was actually the angel of the Lord, was actually the manifestation of God in the creation. Um, and um, it was a one-night trial. Um, and, you know, Jacob struggled with the angel that's what israel means the one who struggles with god and and he did what he had to do um and then god uh, um, decided this was over obviously god could have killed him easily but that was not the point of the trial and so he left in the morning because the the, the trial was over and then jacob said well you know bless me uh before you leave which he did he also wounded his inner thigh and uh, gave him a new name, Israel. And from then on, Jacob is the only character in the Bible who, for whom both names are used. Sometimes he's called Jacob, sometimes he's called Israel. All the other characters who have their names changed, only their new name is used from then on. So the study of those two names definitely carry teachings in them uh, because both of those names are used in the Bible. But yes, that was actually God himself. It wasn't a vampire or a fallen angel or anything like that. I know uh, with our recent documentary we put out um, uh, called Vampires, Lies of the Immortal, we tie in a lot of oh. the ancient rituals that um, were used to worship these fallen entities um, and the blood sacrifices that were offered up into them uh, kind of is the precursor of what modern day vampire lore is. Um, they, you could call them almost primordial vampires because these 
fallen into these, their worship included um, the offering of blood sacrifices and the consumption of blood. Um, so it's a, a, an interesting parallel with these ancient societies that worshipped uh, right. beings and uh, and what today we know as vampires. So maybe he, yeah, maybe you're right. he uh, got some of those questions from our recent film we put out. I see. Um, uh, next question, what is the difference between gray aliens and these Nordics and reptilians? Um, do you have any insight onto that? Yeah, um, the gray aliens um, seem to be the lowest ranking uh, of all of these guys. They, their job is, we only see them really during the abduction sequence, and they're like laborers. They carry stuff around. They, they, they take the people and they lead them into the ships. Um, so they're the, the, the kind of working class. They, they, Mm, they have a, they, you know, they don't even have a mouth uh, slit. I mean, in some of the abduction drawings, I have they, the, the the abductee has just put a mouth for them because they just find it really eerie. Who are they? Um, Dr. Jacobs, who's uh, arguably the world's uh, most renowned researcher into abductions, he believes that they are uh, generation, first generation hybrids themselves made to just be the workforce that carries out this global phenomenon because abducting people from all the nations is what is happening. So it's a lot of work. You need a workforce to do it. Even the ships uh, seem to be completely created for the purpose of abductions. The rooms, the beds are human size. Everything is designed for this purpose. So it's an important purpose. Um, the... Um, uh, reptilians, uh, they are sometimes called the insectoids by some, reptilians by others. They are definitely uh, fallen angels, and they seem to be the highest ranking uh, people that we notice in in, in, in abductions. Um, there are some people who you know cringe at the sight of these guys, they, we have abductees who tell us that they hate it when one of these guys walks in the, in the room. They're not hybrids, and they are something other than us. And since the Bible tells us that we are in the heavens and the earth, and the host of the heavens was created by God, we know that these guys are part of the uh, sons of God, they're part of the enemy, they're part of you know, Satan's kingdom and infrastructure. And you know they, they have very powerful minds. They're the ones that look into people's eyes, and all kinds of thoughts emerge into your mind. So they are able to um, you know tap into your neurology uh, through your eyes. It seems the Dr. Jacob speculates that they use the optic nerve as a conduit to different parts of the brain, and they can put ideas in your minds. They talk telepathically to you, and they also uh, hear your thoughts. And these are scary. So if you go on my Facebook page, by the way, guys, if you want to be friendly on Facebook, you can. But on my personal Facebook page, I just put like, you know, stuff. But it's the UFOs, Angels, and Gods Facebook page that you want to like. That's where I put the information that we like to talk about on this show. Um, so if you go there, you'll see a picture I have that I'm back to, uh, drew of one of these guys look, staring into the eye of a human. And so that is actually a fallen angel. A real one, you get to see one, and um, that's who the reptilians uh, are. And the uh, these are the highest, or the insect sides, or different people have different names for them, but they're the highest ranking ones that we know of in the abduction phenomena. And I would qualify them as fallen angels. When it comes to Nordics, they are some of the earliest hybrids that we see active, so they're partly human and partly fallen angel. And they are present in the UFO phenomenon early on, which means that already in the 50s, there were these hybrids active in the world of abductions. And we do see that later on as well, where sometimes actually hybrids, or what the Bible in its Hebrew calls the Nephilim, are actually involved in the abducting of people who are both donors of genetic material uh, to the fallen angels and their plan to create an alternative race with their own leader at the helm. And they also are the ones who train these hybrids to become human because people are abducted from old, from childhood to old age and at different times in their life, they play different roles in the training of these hybrids. They don't just donate material for their creation. They actually train them to become 
human and be able to integrate into the human world when the signal is given. And right now there's a huge amount of integration happening. So the Nordics are an early prototype of hybrids. The, the reptilians are higher, higher ranking people in this world of abductions and they are fallen angels. And then the greys are the lowest ranking workers of this world of fallen angels. And perhaps they are kind of generation one hybrids themselves. Okay, our next question is from Valerie, and she's asking, where do you think Satan is now? That's a good question. Um, the, there's uh, two possibilities that I have for that. And again, these are just ideas. Like we're on a, around a bonfire having a nice conversation. Don't quote me on any of this. Um, one is that he's in the belly of the earth, that there's an actual kingdom in the earth itself and he is there the other is that he's somewhere in the heavens you know what we would call in our culture outer space and it's fine you know to to call it that once we know that it's not its real name but he you know he's out there um and the moment he walks into this planet being that how important you know he, he powerful he is and all that the moment he walks into the planet essentially the antichrist becomes a ruler of the earth that you know he would only enter the planet for that reason and then boom he gets here bang then this guy becomes you know uh, all powerful uh, so that's one theory that i have that he's out there and he comes at that moment the other theory is that he's actually in the belly of the earth i mean he does say to god in the book of job when god says to him where were you he says i have come from going to and fro in the earth i you know that's obviously not the only time he's done that he's we see that he takes the lord and shows him all the kingdoms of the world so he takes him to a high place maybe on one of his you know chariot i don't know shows him all the kingdoms of the earth so again he's here so he, so the third possibility i guess is that he comes and goes so, or he's cast down and he's bound to the earth and he lives in, somewhere in the belly of the earth. Or two, he's in the heavens and then he's going to show up soon. And three, he comes and goes. Um, you know, whether he stays in one of these chariots or whether he's got another uh, star that he lives in. Um, I don't know. I don't know. All right. Our next question coming in from Cesar is... Do you believe that Edom had Nephilim genes? Um, and the reason he's asking is because uh, there's a character called Sayer, and it is written similar to Sater, um, and that's uh, Strong's Hebrews 8.163, is it, which is a goat devil. And he renamed his descendants as pre-Diluvian characters. And since Amalek was the head of the nations, um, he's asking, is it possible that there's a connection with Ale uh, Alexander the Great, um, who's said to be the son of Zeus? Da -da. Um, okay, well, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, if you ever get a chance to ask that question from Gary Wayne, you know, he, that's, that's a good guy to ask that question from. Um, it does seem, as you know, you've pointed out to both Sayer and Amalek, um, that yes, uh, that it was through Edom uh, that the fallen angels uh, connected to the Abrahamic line. Uh, and there are lots of, you know, tribes that appear uh, from that line that don't have their connection to the 70 nations in the Genesis chapter 10. And that's always suspect in the Bible when you hear of tribes. So the Amalekites um, may have very well been the descendants of the fallen angels and the house of the sons of God and of Edom. Uh, and in that way, they would have tied into Abraham. Uh, and this was what made the Amalekites especially hideous, uh, that they would have dared to mingle themselves with the one that God had chosen out of all the nations uh to accomplish his will this was you know a very close attack and that's why god ordered that the amalekites be completely destroyed their men their women their children and their animals that they should be you know all destroyed uh, and 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 that leads us to the story of purim which is about to come shortly uh in the book of esther 
where one of these descendants of the Amalekites survived. Uh, so there, this is an intergenerational battle. When it comes to uh, Alexander the Great, um, I, I don't know if there's a connection with Amalek uh, and Alexander, but definitely the idea that he was the son of Zeus is very, very interesting. Um, he was the son of Philip of Macedon, technically, but we know that Zeus had many, you know, concubines in the Greek mythology, and we know that the fallen angels uh, had relations with the daughters of Adam and created the hybrids, and this happened before the flood and afterwards, and we know uh, uh, that Satan and Zeus are connected together in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 in the letter to the church of Pergamum. Um, so it's possible that the mother of Alexander the Great, in fact, uh, was raped uh, by by Satan, uh, and that this was a uh, you know a hybrid offspring, uh, and that is why at the age of twenty three he was to present the prince of Greece because the angel that defeated um, that came to Daniel said after the prince of Persia I'm going to go fight the prince of Greece, and the age of twenty three Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire and. The whole no, you know, the main part of the of the world uh, where the great imperial scepter uh, lied, and so yes, it's possible that he was a Nephilim himself, Alexander, and that he was in fact in the bloodline uh, that led to Satan himself, Zeus. So yes, that's but that's a different story for me, at least in my research, than the Amalekites, uh, which are two separate ideas. All right, our next question is, what is the difference between the knowledge Yehuah gave Adam and the knowledge that the Elohim and Watchers gave man? Um, the knowledge that God gave Adam was to establish God's kingdom on earth, uh, to attend to God and to begin to learn about rulership, which is what Adam was created for. Um, but the knowledge that the fallen angels gave was to pervert the knowledge of God, uh, the knowledge that God had given Adam um, for, for selfishness, for rebellion against God's kingdom, and for the strengthening of the rule of Satan. So it was to deflect attention from the instructions of God. And as these instructions were spoken through Moses, we see more clearly how these, this body of knowledge perverts different parts of that knowledge uh, that God gives. I pointed to the idea of swords being created, and the Lord challenges that and says that in a time of the Messiah, the swords will be turned back to pruning hooks. But meanwhile, God has allowed this knowledge to stay with us so that it can be used by us um, if for good. And we can use swords to defend ourselves, you know, we're, because the enemy now has given swords to his people. Well, we need to defend ourselves as well. Um, and and we can have our scientists also, you know, um, use the knowledge uh, to create healing and to create uh, good for God. So the knowledge has, is a bit of a two-edged sword that can be, go either way. But as far as specifically what was the intention of the watchers or the Bene Ha'elohim, the sons of God, by giving that knowledge to Adam, it was to pervert the knowledge that God has given them and deflect it to their own use and to the use of rebellion and the creating of an alternative kingdom than the one of God that would you know, that would um, glorify Satan instead of God and the leader of the world would receive his kingship from Satan rather than from God. So it was to change uh, the story from Adam being a servant of God and, and, and a ruler in God's image to us becoming more and more an extension of the enemy's kingdom. Our next question coming in from Lydia is asking, Ali, first, thank you, excellent presentation. And exactly the issues I have been thinking about are one question regarding monotheism versus paganism. Isn't it a Hindu concept that there's a single creator? Are we more defining monotheism as a single creator, which is clearly more powerful? Uh, because isn't that what Hindus believe, that there's a single creator? Um, yeah, monotheism is an idea, and it's, it's interesting that it's a revelation, it seems. Some ideas are revelations. You, you don't get them until God gives them to you. 
And monotheism was a revelation that God began to teach Abraham, it seems. At the beginning, obviously, it was known that there is one supreme creator who's created the olam, the time and space, and all that is in it, and, and all that's outside of it. Anything that exists was created by this uh, creator who's separate from it all. This idea is lost, and we begin to worship the fallen angels, as scripture testifies. After the flood, God calls Abraham and begins to instruct him in monotheism. What is monotheism? Monotheism is the understanding that there is no equal to God, that there is no parallel to God, and that God is clearly and distinctly separate from his creation, and that all things are the creation other than God. So there's God, and then there's the creation. There is no equal. What's polytheism? Polytheism is the idea that there are many co-creators, that there are many entities who are the masters of what we see and understand to be reality of, of the world. And they 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 have a you know they they struggle with each other. There is no defining character. So this is polytheism. Now in Hinduism, um, we don't see the monotheism of Abraham. I I don't agree that the, that the supreme creators, and I say creators because there are several names. You know, there's Shiva, there's Vishnu. Um, I don't believe that the supreme creator in Hinduism is ever just one alone guy. Um, I remember one Hindu explaining it to me this way because starting in the 10th century, when the Holy Spirit poured over the nations, by the 10th century, even Hinduism had to bow to the monotheism that had come out of the Messianic movement from Israel into the world. So this, so we see that Hindu theologians starting in the 10th century started to explain that actually there was only one God and that, that the many faces we see in the Hinduism is actually the manifestations of the many faces of that one God. So Hinduism was thought, given a new perspective starting in the 10th century. So this Hindu guy explained to me this way. He showed me his fingers and he said, you see all these fingers? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you see, but they all come from the same you know, place. So that one place is the one God, and then he has all these faces. And I'm like, that's really neat, but that's not what's inside of Hinduism. And if you go on some Hindu fundamentalist websites, they're very proud of their polytheism, actually. And when you look at the ancient Hindu texts, as I said, you know, the, the Reg Veda is a good place to start. Clearly, is a polytheistic document. In fact, Indra himself is a demigod. He's, he's a titan, and he's the object of worship. So it's a religion that goes back to the age of the Nephilim, right? It, it has its origins in the age uh, before the flood um, because the character, the main character is actually a Nephilim who is worshipped. Um, and so we see this throughout Hinduism. Now, in modern-day Hinduism, which is mainly the, the cult of uh, Krishna, that's what modern Hindus you know, follow, and they uh, read the book called the song of Lord Krishna, or in Hindu, Bhagavad Gita, this, the song of the Lord, but it's Krishna. Yes, it seems that, that the character Krishna presents himself as one guy, and he claims to be the one who created everything. Now, Krishna is, is a very interesting character. He's usually blue. He's got all sorts of concubines and wives. The teachings of the Bhagavad Gita are not in harmony with the worldview that, that the God of Israel teaches through the Bible. So what are these claims that come out of modern day Hinduism and out of, out of well, this, are, this is what I mean about the post Holy Spirit era where monotheism is championed by the Holy Spirit and the nations are awakened from their dream and reconnected to fellowship with the living God. The enemy recreates his philosophy in the language of monotheism. He basically says, no, 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 yes, there's only one God. You're right, but here he is. And there are other religions out there who will say the same thing. Oh, yes, there's only one God, but here he is. It's like, yes, but does this God have a son? Did this son die for Adam? Um, does uh, Is there atonement in that death? Is, it, is the spirit released? Is the prophecies fulfilled on the stage of history? 
in these other religions? And the answer is no, 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 no. So it is a deception to recreate um, the worship of the one God and say, yes, he's hiding behind this rock, he's behind that one, he's over there. But when you study the content of these revelations that come from these other spiritual forces, and you compare them to the teachings that have come from God, you see that they're very distinct, and that it is the spirit of the pseudo-Messiah that is trying to create an alternative. And that's what the UFO phenomenon, which is a huge religion, uh, People adhere to it all over the place. I mean, I talk to people all the time that actually in their hearts have already converted, but they're, you know, lawyers and judges and doctors and all kinds of people. Um, it's going to come out once it's in the open soon, I think. So, but that's another, you know, idea of, of the other that is to replace God, an alternative. So these are all alternatives at the end of the day presented by the enemy even if they appear to point to the worship of a single God, the teachings are very distinct than the teachings that God has provided us. Therefore, they are more of a distraction. Uh, and so Hinduism has polytheistic origins, and, and only under the influence of the Holy Spirit, it has been forced to uh, bow to monotheistic theology. Okay, our next question is... Um at what point in time and by whom were the stories about Nephilim, i.e. half God, half humans, changed from being considered real to being considered myths? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, um, I, I, the first guy that I uh, was learning this from, I think, was Chuck Missler. He wrote a book called Alien Encounters, and he looked into this whole matter. And he said that it went back to the 5th century uh, of the Christian era. I don't remember the name of the teacher, um, but uh, he said that this is one teacher that really started to replace it with the line of Cain, that replaced the line of, uh, that had commingled the line of Seth, that that's what the story was talking about. It had nothing to do with the fallen angels, the sons of God. So he said it went back to 5th century. Um, and I thought, okay, that's interesting. And then when I was making the documentary, I started shooting in the late 1990s. And I thought, I need someone to talk about the Nephilim and the sons of God and all that stuff. And and I thought, well, uh, who am I going to interview? I mean, we were talking about so many things that were new. There was no scholars that I could even interview. That's why there's a lot of typing in my documentary. I was like, okay, I'm going to have to type this. So I thought to myself, well, the guy who was, who was uh, editing the documentary for me was an uh, old friend of mine. And he was Jew. Well, he is Jewish. He doesn't believe in the Messiah, actually. And, you know, we, we, we've had this lifelong relationship with each other. Um, and I said, well, what, do you know anyone we can interview? He said, well, there's a rabbi uh, we can interview in this very famous synagogue in where I live in Toronto, the Mint Synagogue, one of the oldest, if not the oldest synagogue of Canada. So we said, okay, let's go interview him. So I went, then we went down, got permission. You know, I went to uh, Shabbat uh, dinner, met him, and then uh, he agreed to be interviewed. Finally, the day of the interview came, I went to see him. He sat down, we mic'd him, we put the lights up, and we, it was a whole, it took some time. And I said, okay, so can you teach us about the Bene Elohim in the book of Genesis and what they represent? He said, uh, well, I'm going to have to look that up. I'm like, okay, <laughs> takes the mic off, goes into his office, the door is wide open, I can see it. He consults this book, which I imagine was the book of commentary, Talmud. He opens it up. It was like his face exploded in light. Like he went, like he, like I could see, he was so shocked, totally shocked at what he read. I could see it. And I thought to myself, I got it. Great. He's going to come back and he's going to open it up for us. So he comes back, he sits down, we mic him and everything, and I ask my question again. He says, well, um, the sons of God, is it refers to the line of uh, Cain mingling with the line of Seth. And I'm like, what? And, and so I know this is not what he read. Now, over time, at, at that time I didn't know this, but over time I realized that the Talmud usually has four, the commentary of four, con the Mishnah, the oral law, has the commentary of four, you know, rabbis at least talking about various passages. So one of the commentaries may have been that, um, and that is where the early Christian church 
you know, got it from, I realized. So even before the fifth, fifth century, in Jewish thought already, this idea may have been present because this rabbi, I can tell you for sure he wasn't reading Christian commentary uh, from the stuff he told me on the Shabbat. Uh, <laughs> I, I, he wasn't reading Christian commentary. I can tell you that for sure. So so he he also found this in his in his book. So this was an older idea that Christians maybe may have gotten from the Talmud. Um, now, when it comes to another very influential teacher that pushed things in that direction was Origen. Origen was the teacher of St. Augustine, who was the Bishop of Hippo in Egypt, and a very, very, very important um, uh, influencer for the Western uh, Church. Uh, in, in those days, there was, there was Christianity in the Middle East, uh, into, into India, and into China. I mean, I mean, the gospel reached China 150 years before it reached the Anglo-Saxons. So there was Christianity. But in the West, it was really... St. Augustine, with, with the books that he wrote, um, The City of God, probably the most famous one, influenced the, the thoughts of Christians in the West, and his thoughts were influenced by his teacher, Origen. And Origen was a man who believed in the spiritualization of the Bible, I mean, to its nth degree. He believed that everything was allegory and, and everything was spiritualized. And St. Augustine inherited that. That's where we get the idea from that there won't be actual a kingdom of the Messiah on the earth for a thousand years uh, out of the city of Jerusalem. It comes from Origen, who taught Augustine in an allegorical and highly spiritualized way of understanding biblical teachings, including prophecy, that was all going to occur in a spirit realm, and that all the prophecies, like the ones in the book of Revelation, were simply metaphors and allegories that were recording this battle that was happening in the spirit in the spirit realm where christ now is where the messiah is and when we die we become spirits and we live with him forever even though the messiah came back from the dead in a human body he ate fish he ate honey he showed his wounds he said put your fingers in them you know he he, he came back as a person and this was very important because in his physical resurrection we have a physical resurrection that undoes as i explained what had happened starting in genesis 6 with the sons of God introducing themselves. So that was another teacher, Origen, whose spiritualization sent the mind in a direction that was very far from the possibility of commingling between angels and humans, because now the angels were seen in this very, very ghostly light. Um, so that was another teaching. But there was this other guy whose name I forget, going back to 5th century, and my own experience with this rabbi that had told me this was, was that, wow, even this, this idea had already infected Jewish thought. But again, when you put it back in the context of Scripture and look at all the passages where the sons of God are mentioned, which is Genesis 6-4, Deuteronomy 32-8, Job 37-8, and Job chapter 1 and 2, it's very, very clear that these guys are not human. All right. Our next, our, our final question actually of the night is coming in from Lydia, and she's asking, why do you feel there is a body of knowledge that is solely of man? If man also creates new thought, then the enemy can copy it as well. Uh, can you develop more on this idea of man, man's body versus God and the enemy? Yeah. God um, has created uh, thinking beings, and that's why he can teach us his commandments. Uh, he has given us the ability to receive his commandments. And uh, to receive his commandments, we have been given the ability to reason and to think and to weigh and to choose. So God hasn't created um, robots that just naturally love him. They have no other choice but to love him. They naturally obey him. They have no other choice but to obey him. Then he's created these other guys who naturally disobey him. They have no other choice but to disobey him. No, he's created in us the ability to receive information. So he's created in us thinking process. So we can actually chew on his commandments and grow by chewing on them. He's given us the ability to weigh and reason um, and to consider. And that's why we have all of this commentary and all that stuff. And he's given us the ability ultimately to choose as well, free will. 
And these abilities he's given us, which were intended <laughs> to be at his service, these abilities actually can also be put in the service of ourselves. And we can actually sit down and think and create new thoughts because God has given us also his creative ability. And we do. And I mean, some of the writings from the ancient world, there are writings from the ancient world, writings of wisdom literature, let's call them, that never mention God. I mean, outside of Israel. Or, I mean, they never mention the gods. And like Hinduism, we talked about, but there are other teachings coming outside from other places like China that never mention the gods. They're just human thought. And philosophy as well can come from man, like, you know, Socrates or Plato or, you know. So we we have the ability to create our own thoughts. Um, and that's just one way. You know, we are of the world of God and angels. We are the children of Elohim. And so we think like they do. But their teachings are meant to be kind of the source of law and reality because these laws are the codes of reality. They teach our minds how to understand things. And what we have done is we've copied it. We've taken their codes and we've said, oh, okay, we'll create our own laws. We can create laws, therefore. We can have judges. And we've created our own laws. Um, but by the time we got to creating our own laws, it was after we had received commandments from God and unfortunately, from the enemy. And our laws reflect both, you know? So uh, in the world, uh, in, the, in the pagan uh, world, there was only the laws of the enemy. Um, now, I'm not saying that everything that they put in law was evil. Like if they had created laws that said, go murder, rape, and rampage, well, we would kind of be like, uh, sorry, where is this coming from? So they had to put stuff in there that created order and strength in societies because their idea is not to destroy society in that way, but to rule it, to strengthen it and rule it. Um, then when God spoke his teachings to Israel through, well, after the Holy Spirit came and promoted those teachings to the nations, these two mixed. So now the teachings that came from God and from the fallen angels that these two teachings were in the culture, they mixed. And as I said, man's own commentary and reflection and perspective also kind of came into the mix. And these connected together to start to form the codes uh, of knowledge that give us worldview and understanding of ourselves, of our of reality, of who God is, of where we are, where we're going. This is the basis of how knowledge has taken shape in this world. Fantastic. Ali, that, that, this is just such a comprehensive dive into the sons of God and the, you know, these different mystery religions that seem to be traced all the way through history uh, to today. And I really appreciated how you kind of expounded on just the prophetic significance of, uh, of these mysteries that are being passed down from these fallen entities uh, to mankind. It, just so fascinating. So thank you for coming on to Nice CTV to share with us tonight. You're most welcome. It was great being here and have a wonderful evening. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Now, everybody, we have just a few announcements really quick. Um, John and I are starting to um, uh, put a Patreon account together, so be on the lookout for that. Um, I've also started a blog for our live shows on steamit.com forward slash at Jake to human. And uh, you can find discussions about any live shows and uh, join in on the conversation over there um, on that account. Um, also, if you haven't yet, please jump over on nowyouctv.org and sign up for the uh, newsletter, the email um, messages that we send out. Um, you can find out about future events. We have upcoming conferences that you guys will want to hear about. Um, even as soon as next month, uh, there's one coming up in Sacramento, California. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, everybody, thank you for tuning in to Now You See TV. I've been your host, Jake Grant. And uh, shalom, everybody. Good night.